What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to let you know before we get started with this video that this is going to be a weekly recap of all the stories that have been told in the week in one distinct video. Now, I'm going to be doing these once a week on Sundays so that if you haven't been able to catch any of the videos or if you'd just like something long to go to sleep to or listen to in the background, you can put this video on without having to worry about anything. There will also only be ads at the beginning and end and not in the middle of the video, so you also don't have to worry about that either. For this particular episode, some people have been telling me that they like the background black so that it helps them sleep because they don't have to turn down the dimness on their phone. So I'm going to have the background black for this episode, but let me know if you guys don't like it and we can return to some of the uh, rain footage and stuff that I have in the other longer compilation backgrounds. Without further ado... I will let you guys get into enjoying your long video. Thank you for watching. For some context, my mom at the time was working 40 to 50 hours a week. So while on vacation from school, I was responsible for watching my younger sister. I was a high school junior at this time and I had babysitting experience. So I decided it was okay. I didn't get paid to watch my little sister, but she was a relatively good kid, so it wasn't much of a hassle either. Before my mom went to work, she gave me the normal rules and told me to make sure I keep an eye on my little sister. I shrugged her off and sat on the couch to watch some TV. My sister raced down the stairs 15 minutes later and asked me if she could go next door to collect some old dolls our neighbor had promised her. It was a sweet old lady who was about 65 and had grandkids me and my sister's age. I told her it was fine and to be back in five minutes, to which she put on her sandals to go retrieve those dolls. Around this time, my sister still had a bad habit of leaving the door wide open. I didn't mind most of the time because it was pretty hot out and we lived in a safe public neighborhood. There was slim to no crime there and everyone knew everyone else. That being said though, if you do something bad, your parents will know about it within the hour. I know you're reading this and thinking how dumb it must be to leave the door open, but like I said, it was a very safe place. While my sister was taking off next door, I decided to use the restroom. We have two bathrooms, one half bathroom downstairs for guests and one full bathroom upstairs. While I was in the bathroom downstairs, I could hear my sister slamming the door closed and walking up the stairs to her room. I finished up, flushed, washed my hands, then sat back down on the couch to watch TV. Curious as to what my sister had received, I called out her name. No answer, just a muffled rustling of toys. I decided to leave her alone and turn my attention back to the TV. I was so into the show I was watching, I didn't notice that my little sister was standing right across from me. It didn't click for me at first that I hadn't ever heard her come downstairs. I just stared at her, annoyed that she kept staring at me. I paused the TV and asked her what she wanted. She looked at me wide-eyed and told me someone was upstairs. I laughed at her and told her that wasn't funny. Still though, she was visibly scared. At first, I thought she was joking. I asked her if she had come back home a few minutes ago. She said no. She said the door was closed when she arrived and pointed to the disregarded box of dolls by the back door. I walked into the kitchen, called my dad to come over, and grabbed a big knife from the kitchen drawer. Walking back into the living room, I told my sister to go into the bathroom and lock the door behind her. I told her not to open it until I told her mom was home so she would know it was me. I crept up the stairs and peeked into each room one by one until I got to my little sister's door. It was cracked open and the toys and clothes that were normally organized now littered her room. I didn't wait. I kicked open the door and flicked on the light. My blood instantly turned cold. In my little sister's rocking chair sat this little old woman rocking back and forth with a plastic baby doll. I stepped further into the room and demanded she get the fuck out of my house. I wasn't raised to curse at adults, but this was a strange woman in my little sister's room. She stopped her rocking instantly 
and started to hum the tune to a baby lullaby. The most terrifying part wasn't that she was pretending that baby was real. It was the unnatural smile stretched across her wrinkled face. She stood up and giggled on the way out and down the stairs. I stood there staring at the room, trying to see if anything was missing. I didn't even notice that she'd taken the doll with her. I walked back downstairs and checked the room, before letting my little sister know she could come out after I locked the doors. By then, my dad was pulling up in the driveway up front. I told him what had just happened. He walked around and checked the rooms like I had. While he was upstairs, my little sister told me the old lady knew where she had been and tried to get her to come with her. The creepiest part was that my sister told me. She sounded like she was attempting to sound like me, but when she didn't say mom's home, she stepped away from the door. I don't know who that was that walked into my house to steal my little sister's doll. To be completely honest, men usually never hit on me or approach me at all. This is because I'm a very large woman. It's weird when they do. It's only happened twice in the last six or seven years. The first of those times was okay, but a little uncomfortable. Since I was in an elevator with this complete stranger in my apartment building, and he kept asking me out for coffee. I know I'm not attractive, so I never believe people when they act like I am. I'm also not looking to date. The second time, however, just happened within the last hour. After work, I took the bus down to the grocery store. It's a few minutes in the opposite direction from my apartment, but they have some pretty good deals, so I like to go at least once per month. As I was starting to walk away from the bulk foods area, this is also the only store with the sesame glazed cashews, so I was getting some, I heard someone call out something like, Hey! There were other people in the area, so I figured this person was trying to get the attention of a deli or bakery employee nearby or something. I saw him out of the corner of my eye, but paid no attention and walked off to continue my shopping. I had used the phone in the store that automatically rings up the taxi company to call my ride before exiting, and walking off to the side where the benches are to wait for it to arrive. A few people walked behind the bench as they also left. Then one stopped and said, Hello. I still paid it no attention. The only person I talk to beside customers at work is my sister, and she was back at our apartment. He came a little bit closer and cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> Excuse me. I turned. It was that same guy. It was then that I realized he'd been trying to get my attention inside the store earlier. Oh, uh, hello. I smiled. I really am anxious out in public, but I'm decent at faking friendliness at least. Do you live around here? No, I'm just waiting for my ride home. Ah, well, you know, I live just over there. He pointed at the townhouse complex across the street. I can give you a ride if you'd like. Well, that was fast and forward. Oh, thanks, but that's all right. I already called my ride and it's on my way. Are you certain they're coming? Because it's no problem for me to drive you. I assured him that my ride was for sure on the way. He kept trying over and over to get me to come with him, despite my polite refusals. He offered up to put his number in my phone as well, so I could call him any time, day or night, and he would come pick me up. Well, that was creepy. I told him the truth and said I don't have a cell phone. He immediately challenged that by asking how I called for a ride then. I told him there was a phone inside the store that I used. Are you worried that if I gave you a ride, your husband would kill me? Husband, yeah right. And 35 and never even had a boyfriend. Oh, he might. He can get like that sometimes. Better if I just take my cab when it arrives. I lied. Well, you don't have to tell him that I gave you a ride. That wouldn't be very honest of me. Besides, the folks at the taxi company know who I am, so I can't just no-show them. This was true. I'd been a regular for the past six years, and they even knew me by voice now. He then asked where I'm from. I told him I was from this general area. He told me that he was from Africa. I could tell that already, so I just politely asked which country. He told me and then started talking about being from a tribe and how tribes would fight each other for things, mostly about how whichever tribe won, they could marry the woman from the other tribe and not have to pay for the privilege and whatnot. I was just praying that my cab would come soon. 
I kept turning to check. Finally, it arrived. I stood up and told him, looks like my ride is here. I hopped in the cab and thanked the cabbie for saving me, and finally we were off. That guy must have offered me a ride at least a dozen times. But that wasn't the end of it. As I was getting my stuff out of the cab once arriving at my complex, the man drove past me. He doesn't live here either. He followed me the entire way. I don't know what he hoped to accomplish since the buildings are secured and he doesn't even know my first name, let alone my last, which is the only name listed beside the buzzer. I hustled my fat ass into the building and I hope I don't meet that guy again. When I was a teenager in the late 90s, I briefly worked at a stupid gothy boutique in a big US city. Not Hot Topic, it was more expensive and straightforward goth slash postcard punk. This was the 90s after all. Most of the staff were young, silly, clicky snobs. The customers ranged from perverts to tourists to wannabe rock stars, riding the first tech bubble. The boss was this raging coke and meth head, who would flip out from glassy-eyed, smiling BFF who adored you to lying, manic-aggressive, paranoid monster. Coke boss would, for no reason at all, suspect random staff of conspiring against him. He regularly fired people on a whim, seemingly inspired by paranoid fantasies. Later on, I found out that of course his mom was funding the whole operation. But I never personally had an issue with Coke boss. I was good with customers, got along with staff, and generally kept my head down and sold lots of ugly pleather crap, so whatever. One day, I was taking the bus from shady crap town to goth hellhole for my shift. There was a big stretch during which the bus didn't stop. Pretty sure it was the express stretch. Lots of boarded up buildings and sketchy strip malls. Then a bunch of overpasses. It all looked gray, abandoned, and full of garbage. You know the look. Since it was a long ass bus ride, I zoned out staring at the window. There were maybe eight or so people on the bus, if I recall correctly. I was sitting in the very back corner, basically the farthest away you can get from the doors or anywhere to run. Most everyone else was near the front. Suddenly I got that feeling, you know, the one mentioned often. The whole being watched and the hairs on the back of your neck stand up thing. I could just tell something was wrong. I glanced around the uncommonly quiet bus, it was a guy pacing up and down the aisle. He looked disheveled, underweight, wild-eyed and agitated. He had this huge knife in his hand, bigger than the biggest you'd usually see in a kitchen set. I don't know how long he'd been on the bus, or how long he'd been doing this knife guy thing, but he was really into it now. This is the part where I tell you about the shit I've seen in the city. Blah blah blah, I've seen worse and weirder, etc, etc. But this seemed different right away. Knife guy wasn't an unhinged tragedy who was maybe having a breakdown. He straight up looked like he was actively trying to decide who to stab first. Knife guy was halfway down the aisle at this point, facing my direction. His eyes were darting around manically. If it hadn't been so scary, it might have almost been funny. He genuinely looked like generic scary dude from Central Casting. The knife was no longer just at his side. He was raising it in front of himself. He's holding it in the classic handle on the thumb side, blade on the pinky side, stabby stab style mode, straight out of a horror movie. His eyes are darting around, and nobody is doing anything. This all happened right within a matter of moments. The knife guy looks right at me. I'm all alone in the back. He's still doing the psycho shower scene knife stance, and without breaking eye contact, he starts walking toward me very deliberately. I remember feeling nothing but incredible calm in that moment, staring at him and thinking, well, I guess maybe I'll die now. It was like I rocketed through the stages of grief straight to acceptance. Totally one of those you never know what you'll do till you're in it moments. Apparently my will to live decided to immediately peace out. He's picking up the pace with his big knife out, but somehow everything seems to be slowing down. Not only is time slowing, it feels like everything is physically actually slowing down. Then I realize that it is. The bus has slowed, then stopped. Even though there's no bus stop and nobody pulled the cord, the bus pulls over to the side of the road and the doors open. 
The bus doesn't move. The driver doesn't move. Nobody moves. The knife guy stops in his tracks too. He then turns and looks at the door. He looks at me. He looks at the door. He looks back at me. It takes a moment, but he drops his arm and casually gets off the bus like nothing ever happened. The doors close. The bus sits there. I see out the window knife guy crossing the street. He throws the knife in the city trash can and runs off. The cops pulled off soon after. I still have no idea how or when this all happened, who knew what and when, but the bus driver obviously had done his best, and it turned out alright in the end. I decided to violate my never snitch rule and go to the station to give a statement. I was totally numb. The cop was nice and gave me a ride to work so I wouldn't be late. When I walked in, the coke boss was there, and he was in one of his moods. The shop was busy and he was flooding about getting in everyone's way, fussing around with things. Something about the loud, garish, stupid environment with the stupid music. And the a-hole customers, the snobby staff, and the cuckoo coke boss getting in everybody's face made me break. I started shaking and went to the back to clock in. Now I was starting to realize what actually just happened. The coke boss followed me into the back and starts in. His syrupy, phony, how's it going girlfriend with his plastered on smile. I was obviously not okay. I started spilling how the cops dropped me off. I thought I was going to die. How he had this huge knife. I was struggling not to cry. The coke boss just stared at me. Then he goes, I don't have time for this shit. And goes back to the sales floor. That night I got drunk. And the next day was a no call on purpose and got fired. Coke boss, whatever you are. Fuck you. Let's not meet again. Oh, and you neither, knife guy. And this happened about a year ago, while I was living in a major Midwestern city. My partner and I were in a long-distance relationship at the time, and they had flown out for the weekend to celebrate my birthday. We both love animals, and I decided to take them out to the zoo before going out for a nice dinner. I don't have a car, but I'd recently gotten a free invite for a rideshare service called Via, similar to Lyft and Uber. I decided to use it that night. I called us a car and we waited outside. It's important to note that the city I lived in was generally liberal and LGBT friendly, at least until you got into the suburbs. My partner and I are a gay interracial couple, which has led to some weird encounters when we were living in a more rural area, but never anything that felt immediately threatening. The car pulls up and we say hello to the driver, ask how his day is going. He nodded at us, but didn't say anything. I didn't really think anything of it. Some people aren't very chatty, you know, so we started discussing the logistics for the evening. We were both pretty wrapped up in our conversation since we hadn't seen each other in two months, but I soon noticed that the driver was taking a strange route. The zoo was directly north of my house, only about 12 minutes away, when he turned on to the on-ramp for a highway going south, which is an industrial area. I don't drive, like I said, so I assumed that either he'd made a wrong turn, or he had decided to take a shortcut. We continued chatting for a little over five minutes, and we were still on the freeway, heading in what was obviously the wrong direction. I checked the Via app to see if I had ordered a group ride. Maybe he was picking someone else up. That's when I noticed a stark difference between the map open on his dashboard and my phone application. The Via app clearly showed us far away from the planned route, while whatever map was open on his phone was directing him to another location far enough away that it wasn't even still visible on the screen. At this point, I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach, and I could tell my partner was on edge as well. They tried to get his attention, asking if he had gotten the location correct. He just muttered something under his breath and continued driving in silence. We were now 40 minutes away from the zoo and had no idea where we were heading. We asked him again where we were driving, and he just told us he didn't speak English. My partner's parents are from the same country, however, and they later told me it would be pretty obvious that he was pretending not to understand what we were saying. My phone was low on battery now. It had begun to snow, and we were well outside city limits, quickly approaching the edge of Via's service range. 
At this point, both of us began loudly telling him to turn around and to just drop us back off at the house. I pulled up the app on my phone. There was no service number, but I told him that I was contacting Via about the error right now. He immediately pulled onto our freeway exit. It was barren other than a strip mall with only a Verizon and a grocery store. He cut the engine, turned around, and in clear English, told us to get out of his car and that the ride was now over. I tried to see what navigating app he had open, but he immediately closed out the screen. Luckily, we were able to walk to the Verizon store, where we were able to charge our phones, and I found someone to pick us up. There were no ride services nearby. We were so far away that it took almost an hour for our friend to arrive. Once we got back, neither of us felt like going out anymore. I tried to report the incident to Via, but they said he had confirmed that he had dropped us off at the zoo through the app, which conflicted with my GPS tracking. All the rep did was apologize and give some credit for a future ride which I didn't use, of course. I don't know where he was planning to take us, but my partner comes from a very conservative and religious country and believes something very bad could have happened. Okay, so this happened about 15 years ago, but to this day I cannot live in a ground floor building. When I was around 15, I was staying over at my mom's house for the weekend. My parents are divorced, so it was just me and her at home. It was about 12.30 a.m., and I was just chilling in the living room watching some TV while my mom was asleep. The living room had two windows that faced the front yard, and I often left the curtains open, as the house was set back from the road. My mom's house was not in the best part of town, but I've always felt relatively safe there. While I was watching TV in my pajamas, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye from the window that was closest to me. It was only about four feet away. I turned to look out the window. A man's face was staring right back at me, smiling the most hideous grin I had ever seen. I was frozen, and for about 20 seconds, I just sat there, with my eyes locked directly on his. Suddenly, my panic set in, and I leapt up from the sofa and tried to run to my mom. I slammed my leg right above the knee into the wooden coffee table, and I fell onto the ground, my leg feeling like it was made of jelly. I scrambled up, and I began to shout for my mom. My mom came running in half asleep, wondering what was wrong. I started to stammer. I tried to make out that someone was in the window watching me. Just as my mom was starting to realize what I was saying, we both heard someone attempting to open the front door to the house. My mom and I both stood still, thanking God that it was double locked. But when it stopped, my mother had a horribly grave look and just whispered, The back door. She turned and bolted through the house, scrambling to turn the deadbolt on the back door in the kitchen and she finally backed away once it was done. She then ran to her room and pulled a baseball bat from beneath her bed. I knew she kept it there because she was a woman living alone. She was frantic. She asked me to call the police, which I did, whispering to the operator that someone was trying to break into my house. We then saw a shadow approach the back door quickly, trying desperately to open the door, kicking and grunting while they tried to get in. My mother shouted through the door, I have a bat, and I will fucking kill you if you try to get in this house. We've called the police, and they're on their way. And the person on the other side of the door stopped, and was still for about 30 seconds before turning and running away. My mom and I stood in the middle of the kitchen for the 20 minutes it took the police to get to us, the whole time my mother had the bat raised and ready to strike. When the police finally came, they looked around the house. And they found that the flowers outside the window were trampled, and there were several cigarette butts on the ground outside the window where I saw the man. No one in my house smokes, and the police assumed he'd been there for a while. They didn't find him, of course, but they took my description. We've never heard anything more about it, though. My mom moved away from that house a year later, even though we never had another incident. I now live in another country with my husband, who wonders why I have no desire to own a house and love living in high-rise apartments. I also pay for state-of-the-art home security, and I keep a baseball bat in my closet, just like mom. 
I have no idea what would have happened if my mother had not realized the back door was unlocked and beaten the man to it, or if for some reason my mother wasn't there that night, as she worked late sometimes. I don't know if the man thought he could overpower two women alone, or if he was just trying to scare us. Writing this down was difficult for me. I hope this story fits in the sub. When I was around 14, I had an appointment at a bank with my mom. She wanted to set up an account for me. So one afternoon, we were downtown in the bank building. I remember feeling really bored by the entire process. It was that kind of dry financial stuff, and I would have rather stayed at home to play video games or something. My mom noticed after a few minutes, and then confirmed with the bank employee that I was actually just needed to sign the papers in the end. For everything else, I really didn't need to be there. Since we were already downtown, my mom gave me a bit of money, and told me to go buy myself some new clothes. I didn't care about my appearance at all back then, so I always looked kind of slobbish. The whole thing would probably still take about an hour and so it would be fine if I was back by then. I went to the mall first, since I knew that there were some cheap stores around there. While I was browsing through some clothes, I noticed an older man, around 60, I'd guess. There wasn't anything creepy or remarkable about him. I just thought it was weird seeing someone that age in a store for predominantly young people. I then proceeded to see this guy a few more times in the mall. I shrugged it off at first, but after a while, I began to realize that he was actually following me. I even tried to test it out and made a little game out of it. It soon became clear that he would always go into or near the same stores that I entered. Now, I was a naive young boy. Besides from the fact that he was following me, there was nothing weird about this old man at all. I couldn't have even imagined his actual intentions. I just thought he was some bored old geezer who liked to play shop detective in his free time. Maybe he mistakenly thought I'd stolen something when I was in the first store. Yeah, I was pretty dumb back then. When I left the mall, the man still continued to follow me throughout the city. I wasn't scared at this point, but I was beginning to get slightly irritated. I chose to ignore him for the time being, and just tried to take care of the rest of my shopping. When I entered the next store, he didn't seem to follow me at first, but as I was choosing some clothes in the upper level, I noticed him again a few shelves away. I went into the changing room. God, how can someone be that dumb? To try out some of the stuff, and while I was doing that, I heard slow steps very close to the booth I was in. I knew that it was the man, and at this point I thought it was kind of creepy. Still, I didn't understand what was going on. He didn't linger there for too long, but he remained at the store which I left after deciding not to buy anything. At this point, I'd had enough. After leaving the building, I immediately hid behind one of the pillars which led to the entrance. I saw him walk out of the store and look around for me, but he didn't notice me and went away. I thought at that point that I was rid of him. The problem was, the bank building where my mother waited was in the same direction that the man had just walked away. I decided it would probably be safer to wait for a bit, so I went into the McDonald's opposite of the clothing store and decided to get myself a burger. Then, while I was eating it outside of the McDonald's, the man actually came back. At this point, I'd had enough. It was obvious that guy wasn't any kind of shop detective, so what the hell did he want? I was really annoyed at him for following me and creeping me out, but I was also kind of curious what his deal was. God, I'm so dumb. What I did next. Please never do this. I would not have done this had I known what he actually wanted. I lured him away. At the end of the street, there was this nice breakfast place which closes in the afternoon. So at that time, there weren't any people near the benches and chairs in front of the place. I walked over, and I sat down on one of the benches. I nervously played around with my MP3 player. I knew what I was doing was dangerous, but my curiosity just got the better of me. And as weird as it may sound, it was also kind of thrilling, to be honest. It didn't take much longer after that for the stalker to walk out of nowhere and sit down on the bench opposite of mine. 
He didn't introduce himself or ask for my name. He just started some small talk. He started telling me he was not from around here, but that I looked like I could show him around. This felt really weird to me, but I was kind of relieved as he didn't seem to come off as a bad guy. I told him politely I didn't have the time since I needed to go back to my mom soon. Suddenly, he asked if I had enough time to show him just one place, the park. I asked him which park he wanted to go to, but he just replied, any park will do. Something really started feeling off there. Luckily, there was one nearby, extremely easy to find. I started explaining the directions to him, but he interrupted me. He told me he wanted me to take him there personally. I almost agreed and started to lead the way, but as we started walking with neither of us saying anything, I slowly realized what was happening. I froze in place. He turned back around and stared at me, asking if I didn't want to go to the park with him after all. I panicked and screamed, No! This caused a lot of people to turn towards us. This was happening in a busy intersection after all. The man stood there dumbfounded and just said, uh, Bye. He left, while I immediately ran back to the bank building to tell my mom what had happened. She was still talking to the employee from before. She was present when I told my mom, but I was so shook that I didn't care. She got angry, of course, and told me that if anyone ever tried that again, that I should kick their ass. And that's really questionable advice to give to a child, but that's kind of how my mom shows support. There's a lot of stuff that I left out about the encounter, but I feel like this is all long enough already. A little backstory. My son has been battling cancer for over two years. He receives treatments at a hospital nearly three hours from our home, in a neighboring state. During this time, our only car had broken down. Due to financial issues, cancer treatments are expensive even with insurance. We just couldn't afford to get it fixed or replaced. We were stuck using medical transportation through our insurance to get to and from appointments. Transportation is provided by contracted individuals who use their private vehicles. Most drivers live in our home state. This story involves one of those drivers, and took place almost a year ago. My son and I were leaving the hospital to return home after a one-week inpatient stay for chemotherapy. We had problems with the driver we were assigned hours in advance of him even showing up. Over an hour after the scheduled pickup time, I called the dispatch to see if they could get an ETA. They contacted him and told me he was just coming into the city but because of traffic, he didn't want to give an estimate as to when he would arrive. Weird, but fine, I guess. I figured he would be less than half an hour away, so we waited, and waited. After another two hours of waiting, I called again. This time, he told dispatch that he was just crossing the state line, and would be at the hospital in about two hours. What the fuck? Needless to say, I was not at all amused. Maybe I was being a little choosing beggarish, but we were both exhausted and just wanted to get home to the rest of our family. Besides that, the ride was scheduled far in advance. He knew several days ahead of time what time he was supposed to get there. Drivers are supposed to be there waiting at the time of discharge. Five hours later, more than 8.5 hours after our scheduled pickup time, he finally called me to say he had arrived. By this time, I was beyond irritated with this guy. He had obviously lied to dispatch, more than once. I found out in the first few minutes of meeting him that he lives in the same small town we live in. It took him 8.5 hours to drive three. A sure thing. While he was helping put our bags in the trunk, and before we even left the hospital parking, he misgendered my son several times. My son has a masculine name. He also definitely looks like a boy. It honestly felt like he was doing it on purpose. I corrected him, kindly, even though I was beyond pissed at this point. He apologized and told us he had had a massive heart attack a few years ago and had brain damage from lack of oxygen because he stopped breathing during the event. He said the brain damage caused him to sometimes use the wrong words. 
I felt a little bad for being mad at him after that, but I was also concerned and a little incredulous. I couldn't help feeling like this was a cover story designed to placate and manipulate. I might have become a little bit of a Karen in my thinking towards him at this point. He was a chatty guy, and I was also talking to him. I was being perfectly friendly, even though I wasn't happy with him. After we got on the road to start our three-hour drive home, he began to text while driving. I told him to stop. He said he was texting his wife to tell her he was on his way back. I told him, of course, that I didn't care who he was texting. He wasn't going to text and drive with my child in the car. He should have done it before we left the hospital. Or he could just pull over if it was that important. I wasn't unkind, but I was very matter-of-fact about it. He was visibly irritated, but he put his phone down. After that, he would straight-up ignore anything I said to him, and he had stopped talking altogether. I gave it a few goes, trying to be friendly and show that I wasn't mad, but he wanted no part of it, so I got out my Kindle and started to read. A few times throughout the drive, I noticed him slyly slide his phone up onto his leg. It was obvious he was trying to do this without me noticing. Each time I noticed, I would turn my Kindle off and look out at the road. He would let out an exacerbated sigh and slide his phone back down into the center console. After a few minutes, I would go back to reading. But when we finally got into our house, he didn't even say anything to me when he gave me the logbook to sign. He also didn't get out of the car to help carry our stuff to the house, which is something the drivers are supposed to do. I honestly didn't care about that last part though, because I just wanted to get away from the guy. It was nearly midnight at this point. Less than half an hour after we got home, I got a text from a blocked number, something that's never happened to me previously. The text was just a string of insults and expletives, commenting on everything from the quality of my character to my looks. I have no way of proving it, of course, and maybe I was jumping to conclusions, but I felt like this message had to have come from the driver. Very few people have my phone number, and it was such a short time after our encounter with him ended, it just seemed like the most likely scenario. The following day, my husband convinced me to report the driver for texting while driving. I made no mention of the text while talking to the company, because I had no proof he was the origin. There weren't any further texts at this time. About a week later, an investigator from the transportation company called to get more information about the incident. I only told the facts about what happened. Once again, I did not mention the text. The investigator told me the driver would be written up and sent in for additional training. The next day, I received another text from a blocked number. This one was full of more personal attacks and colorful language. I don't remember the details because this was nearly a year ago but there were vague threats and a mention of messing with someone's livelihood, too. That last part made me really think the messages were from him. Especially since the text came just a little over 24 hours after the investigator had called me. I figured he probably just received the reprimand and sent the text in response. Still, I had no proof it was him, and it was all just a theory on my part. Over the next several days, the text kept coming in, escalating in tone. I finally decided it might be time to report them to the police, when the next text left little doubt in my mind as to who was sending them. It made mention of the report I had made to the company. It also contained less vague threats in it, and mentioned that he still had my address in his GPS. I filed the police report. They investigated, but unfortunately the texts all came from an untraceable prepaid phone. I changed my number, and the text stopped. I also made an additional report to the transportation company, where I provided the texts and the police report to the investigator. It turns out the police had already been in contact with them, and the company had already let the driver go. We also moved shortly after the last text. Maybe it was silly to do so, but the guy did make some pretty serious threats, and he did know where we lived. I know most people are just full of hot air when they make those kinds of threats, but we weren't willing to take any chances. There are also some very scary people out there. Also, it might have proved to be warranted. Fast forward to the first week of May of this year. While watching the 6 o'clock news, we see a story about a local man who had an altercation with his brother that ended in the brother stabbing him 20 plus times. The man later died at the hospital, and the brother was wanted for murder. When they showed the name of the brother and his photo, I nearly fell out of my seat. 
It was that same driver. He was apprehended by police by the time the 11 o'clock news had aired. This occurred to me and my then-girlfriend in the summer of 2004. I'll need to provide a bit of context first, though, so the context will be the first little bit here. My hometown was decimated by flooding from Hurricane Floyd in 1999. Part of the response and recovery efforts involved FEMA setting up RVs as temporary housing for those whose homes were either destroyed or heavily damaged. These RVs were set up in a previously vacant field just outside of town. The park was dismantled by 2001 or so. They put up fencing around the outer perimeter and trenched over the other streets into the area to keep people out. They forgot one entrance, though, or I suppose left it purposely open for emergency vehicles to have access. Some friends of mine had found this entrance, and we frequently used the area as a playground. We would go back there to set off fireworks, turn the streets into a race course, and of course, to have sex with our girlfriends. To set the stage on how this place looks, there were three streets running east-west orientation, a street that went around the other streets in an oval fashion. The grass was very overgrown, and about four feet high or so. The south and north side of the area was wooded. The east side had this large dirt berms that were about 20 feet high and had been placed there when the site was graded in 1999. They normally provided a climbing challenge for our SUVs. This particular day, this particular day, my girlfriend and I were parked on one of the east-west streets amongst the tall grass to remain hidden. We got undressed to have sex in the back seat of the car. As we began, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look, and there was a man coming over the 20-foot high dirt berm. He's wearing denim overalls, and in his left hand is a full-sized axe. A wave of fear washed over me, and I yelled out, Oh my god! My girlfriend popped up to look out the back windshield and let out a scream. I frantically started looking for the car keys. There was a pile of clothes on the floorboards, and I couldn't find them. I looked out the back, and the man was slowly getting closer. I could see his face now, with an emotionless, blank stare. I started grabbing clothes and shaking them to hopefully find the keys. Finally, they popped loose and fell onto the floor. I grabbed them and jumped into the driver's seat, still completely naked. I started the car, and from the back seat, my still-naked girlfriend screams... I look in the rearview mirror as I'm putting the car in drive. He's now within 50 to 60 feet of the car. Same blank look, but staring at the car with that axe in his hand. I didn't even fasten my seatbelt. I was still fully nude as I floored the gas, kicking up rocks everywhere as the tires spun. I sped away from the man holding the axe. We got out of the abandoned FEMA park as quickly as I could drive the car without crashing. My girlfriend was hysterical the whole time, until we got back to the main road and were safe. We stopped about a mile up on the side of the road to put our clothes back on and de-stress. I don't know where this man could have come from, as there are no houses within a mile or so of the old FEMA site. He seemingly came out of nowhere. I also didn't see any other cars at the site either, as I had done a lap around the park before we chose our spot to park. I'm not sure what his intentions were, as he never said anything to us, and I know he saw us panicking there in the car. Whatever they were, though, I do know they couldn't be good. The look on his face and the axe in his hands made that abundantly clear. I went back with a few friends a few days later and found no place this guy could have been lurking. There were no signs anyone had been camping there either. To this day, it's still one of the scariest events I've ever been through. Hi everyone, this incident happened about five years ago. This is a story I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation. 
without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. You guys here seem to get it though, so here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, around 4.30pm, unlocked my door and went inside. I set my phone, wallet, and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me. I immediately began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was a habit for me to not lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would soon be home anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through my bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry I'd started earlier in the day before work. I heard my front door open and I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a little early it seemed and I happily called out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence and slowly began to feel that sinking feeling of something is wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me and walked out into my living room slash kitchen area. While standing on the other side of my kitchen was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me. I would estimate 50s, but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment. He was just standing there, staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. I wondered if he'd maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at this stranger in my house. I stood taller and puffed up my chest in an attempt to look threatening, which is hard to do as a small female. I used a loud, clear voice, telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me, like I'd never spoken. Then he began to pick up my things, my cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them into his own pockets. This is when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward to the only other device I had that would allow me to get help, my computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but I still had about 12 to 15 feet between us, so I knew I could grab it and run before it could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me. I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us, my bathroom door and the closet door. I slammed and locked the first door, and within mere seconds I could already hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on my Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message, pleading with him to call 911 and told him there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me he already had a dispatcher on the phone and was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened and the intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen. With fear, with shock, I don't know. I didn't scream though, or cry, or search for a weapon in that dark closet. I didn't brace for the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled in my closet and waited to die, because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I'd screamed, someone would have heard and come to help. I mean, surely there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop I had would hurt if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? Well, I don't really have an answer for that. The closet door, though, miraculously held. I could hear frustrated footsteps go back out into the living area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet, silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling death was inevitable. I feel awful about my selfishness in this moment, but I messaged my mom who lived a 15 hour drive away and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort, 
and to tell her how much I loved her. I'm not a parent, but I could only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through, knowing her daughter was in danger and there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers I loved them just in case. To help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader left me in. I could hear the front door open again. It was my husband shouting for me. The intruder walked out toward the living room and kitchen area again, where my front door was located. I opened the closet door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling, at times yelling, but never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that, but from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time they arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way. It just always seemed like an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report and telling them everything that happened. One of the officers commented that I really should keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time or blaming me for what happened, but I later recognized his words were coming from lots of experience. I'm sure in his time he'd seen this situation end much differently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen to me again. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Please consider continuing because it isn't all doom and gloom. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're still struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking of your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose a third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that isolated incidents of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night, though. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often works night shifts now, and I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now if I was back then. If I hadn't changed anything other than locking my door, I knew I would freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough or having a door hold long enough to save me. That was simply unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, introduced myself and started taking classes. At first I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who is both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him. He's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it has made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist anymore. I'm confident, strong worthy of living and protecting myself in my own home. I'm no longer ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but also understand what steps I can take to ensure I'm safe in the future. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this may not be a solution or option for everyone. Your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story, that's the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it, and it worked well enough for me. Thank you again for listening.
I'm a little afraid to share this because I'm not sure how people will respond, but maybe doing so will help someone else that's feeling alone with this. If anyone else is struggling with their own story and wants a kind ear to listen, I'm here. Stay safe out there. When I was about 24, I was always busy with work and lived in a small historic town. Needless to say, I didn't get out very much. This is why I was so excited when my 30-something cousin came up from Fresno to visit. I was also excited when she wanted to go check out the scene on the first night that she stayed with me. As it turned out, she was a drinker, so we headed out to hit up a few small bars in my town. We only ended up finding one bar that was kinda happening. It had a pool table, plus it allowed smoking inside, so we were sold. I decided to sit at the bar. My cousin headed off to play pool with some guys. As I'm sitting at the bar sipping my drink and checking my phone, I get a tap on my shoulder. I turn to see an older gentleman, who I didn't recognize right away. Seeing my puzzled look, he exclaims, It's me, Cody's dad. I then instantly realized that he was the father of a boy I had dated in the 8th grade when I was about 14. His dad seemed nice enough, but I did remember that he was a pretty stern character back then. Sometimes, as punishment for his son, he would have him dig trenches even in the summertime, in the hard pan rocky ground. I could even remember hanging out at his house back in the day, and just getting a bad feeling about his dad. I never experienced anything around his dad, though, that would justify that feeling. So, of course, I was surprised he even recognized me at all, all these years later. He bought me a drink, and we started catching up a little. As we were talking, my cousin comes over to check in with me, upon seeing a much older man at the bar speaking with me. Eventually, he suggested that we go outside to smoke, since the bar was getting pretty smoky. Once we were outside, though... I realized we were pretty much all alone. This was fine, I figured, since he was always one of my distant neighbors who I had known on and off over the years, but I figured wrong. I began to understand that as he started asking me more personal questions. He started asking me about whether or not I had a boyfriend, or if I'd ever consider dating an older guy. It started getting uncomfortable, so I suggested that we go back in where it was a bit warmer. Again, after a few moments, though, he wanted to go back outside. At that point, I was trying to blow him off politely. My cousin saw all of this, since she was now walking over again to check in with me. She gave me a sort of warning look before turning and walking back to her game of pool. As the night progressed, he tried to continue to get me to go outside with him. This time, though, he wanted to go to his truck. Finally, he just had enough and grabbed my arm and tried to pull me outside with him. Thank God for my cousin, though, because she seemed to materialize out of nowhere. She grabbed my other arm, yelling fuck off to him. He backed off and disappeared into the small crowd, hastily making a break for the back exit. The rest of that night, we enjoyed ourselves and had some much-needed fun. It wasn't until about six months later that I heard a horrifying story about him from another neighbor. I was told that he was now in prison, probably for life. Apparently, he had been stalking and watching his soon-to-be ex-wife at their former home for months. Eventually, he had decided to just straight-up kidnap her, tying her up and gagging her. He then put her in his truck or back seat and drove her down towards Mexico. In Los Angeles, California, he decided they should stop for the night, as it was about an eight-hour drive from our hometown. That night, on that stay, he repeatedly raped, beat, and tortured her. He had apparently told her he was taking her to Mexico to kill her. He had been treating her that way for years. Upon hearing that, I knew that my bad feeling as a kid was justified. I'm now getting chills just writing this part. Somehow, thank God, she managed to escape his brutal attack that night. He was arrested pretty quickly after that. So this happened on Halloween, when I was about 11. My friend and I decided to go trick-or-treating. Yeah, we were a little bit old, but we just wanted some free candy. I lived in a very nice neighborhood, one of the ones where everyone gives you a full-sized candy bar, 
so it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people come there to trick-or-treat. However, that also meant that there's about an acre of front yard for each house, so it took about three minutes to walk between each front door. It was a good night for Halloween weather-wise. Not too chilly, not too rainy or anything. This is important for later. It was approaching 8.30 p.m., and after hanging around on the golf course and appreciating our massive candy haul, we decided it was a good time to start heading home and call it a night. The street I live on is a gigantic U-shape, like just about a little over a half mile walk from the top of the U down to the bend to the other side. We were walking towards the end of the U further from my house, as we wanted to take the long way since it was such a nice night out. It was around 9pm now, so no one else was really out anymore at this point. People turned off their porch lights, the universal sign for no more trick-or-treaters. That's when we noticed, though, a lone white van parked on the street. We made a joke about how much it looked like the stereotypical kidnap vans with the painted windows. That's when we noticed it shift out of park and slowly creep down the street towards us and park at the next house over. Oh, they must have kids trick-or-treating. It wasn't uncommon for people to drive their kids from house to house since they were so spread out in our neighborhood. But given that it was 9 p.m. and a night with nice weather, it struck us as a bit odd. We checked every few minutes, and it seemed to just be stopping from house to house like normal. We turned around again, and kept walking at a leisurely pace, gossiping and having fun and whatnot. And that's when we heard the car squeal as it moved forward down the hill and park again, this time only about two houses away from us on the opposite side of the street. Again, a weird time to trick or treat, but whatever. That was when we realized, though, there were no kids getting out of the van, not even once. Now, this was before my first phone, a red and white Samsung Propel since it was 2008. We were only 15 minutes from my house, but a bit disturbed. We walked towards the nearest door, rang the bell, and stuck out our bags in an attempt to act normal. A woman opened the door just a crack and proceeded to berate us for trying to trick-or-treat at this late hour. She slammed the door before we could even say a word. Okay, thanks, lady. We turned around, and the fan was now right there, parked in the wrong direction, on our side of the street. The windows were tinted, so we couldn't even see the person driving. Trying to keep our cool, we casually walk away from the door and up the street, into this cul-de-sac loop that's on the side of the street that makes up the bigger U. If you cut through that loop and hop a couple fences, you can end up right at my back door. The van followed us the same way. We now know he's following us, since there would be no reason for him to go up this side street otherwise. We break into a sprint, and I am by no means athletic, but I hop those fences like a damn Olympian. We run inside my house, lock all the doors, and freak out while we sit in the front hall. Not five minutes later, the van slowly coasts down the street right past my house. We stress eat our candy and think of what could have happened if we hadn't been aware of our surroundings. This happened when I was in my early teens in the late 80s. My family lived in a very secluded, forested area. We had a long driveway, and our small home sat on a square acre of mowed grass with woods on either side. I was alone late one night, talking with a good buddy from school. I often rode my bike to town over the summer, and he invited me to come over and spend the night. It was a 20-mile trip over completely empty country roads, but it was always an adventure, and I seldom hesitated to go when I had a place to stay. I told him it was a sure thing. I'd call my mother at work and then start my ride. Here's where it gets creepy. Once I had hung up the phone and started getting dressed, I decided to wear all black. I picked up the phone again to call my mother. This time, though, the line was dead. This had never happened before. It was a fairly sturdy rotary phone, and we'd never had any problems with it. 
My thoughts instantly went to the small phone box on the back of the house. It was a tiny round junction with nothing but a rubber covering. Behind the cover was the exposed connection between the foam pole and our inside line. The wires were twisted together and capped, but completely vulnerable. I questioned why I would even think about that. Why would I jump to conclusions just because of a random dead line? I was overwhelmed with a sudden feeling of dread that didn't make sense, and I was trying to wrestle with my thoughts. I decided I'd behave as though I was in some real danger, but calm myself by focusing on just how unlikely it was. My imagination was probably just getting the best of me, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that somehow I was in trouble. I finished dressing up and strapped a buck knife to my hip, the old Rambo knives with the compass and the stock. It was cheap, but very big. I moved quietly and planned on how I would leave the house. I remember this very well. I would slide out the front door and pull it closed behind me, locked. I would not be able to get back in. I would grab my bike from against the wall on the enclosed porch, spin around, and use my elbow to press the button of the handle on the screen door and jump down the concrete steps. I'd hop on my bike and speed down the drive. It was very dark outside, but there were bright lights in the front and rear of the house that created big pools of light in the yard. That was all the light I would have. I executed my maneuver just as I'd planned, but my elbow slipped off the button on the handle and banged into the door as it opened. Within seconds, I was pumping down the gravel drive. I turned my head to the left, filling my ears with a roar of air as I was cutting through and stopped pedaling my eyes fixed on the rear of the house. I was 100% sure someone was coming. I don't know how or why. It was only a moment, but I didn't look away despite my own skepticism. And in the very last instant before I felt like I should turn away, I saw him. A man, wearing dark clothes and a ski mask, came tearing out of the lit yard around the back of the house and plunged into the deep shadow along the side, heading for the front where I had been only seconds ago. I just happened to be invisible in the night, wearing black from head to toe, and instead of running straight for me, I guess he didn't see me. He went directly for the porch, where the commotion I'd just made had come from. I turned forward and leaned into the pedals. I could barely see the driveway, but I had ridden my bike down it many times at night, and I could make out the large stone gate post before the dirt road. I almost wrecked turning the corner, but recovered and speeded away. About a mile further, and I finally stopped at the intersection to a paved road. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my forehead was sweaty. I stood there for a bit and got my breathing under control, while I tried to digest what had just happened. My thoughts were racing. I knew damn well what I'd seen, but I was out of the danger. All I could do was press onward. My neighbors were Amish, so no phone there. I wouldn't have known what to say anyway. When I got to my friend's house much later, I told them what happened and called my mother. She listened and didn't give me a hard time, but I could tell she didn't quite know what to think. She wouldn't be home until morning and said she'd be careful. And that was it. I had heard laughter once from the edge of the woods, and things in the yard had been moved on occasion but no one else had these experiences, and I always assumed it was backwards Amish kids just fooling around. Nothing had ever really happened before. I sincerely doubt any Amish kids would know how to disconnect a phone line, though. So this happened a couple of months ago, when I took my mom to a place in Europe for a quiet little week away, before I was having an operation. Nothing too serious, just my knee. I was still using one crutch because of this. We'd spent ages looking for a nice little hotel where we could relax, and still be close to the town center of our destination, including looking at all the reviews we could find, to make sure it would be a nice little getaway we both desperately needed. We get to the hotel, and it's set off the street. We almost couldn't find it, as it wasn't visible from the main road. Up a driveway in what seemed to be a fairly residential area. No big deal. 
We'd be getting that relaxation and bucket loads if this area was residential. So, off we trot to explore and go for drinks and dinner. A lovely little place on the seafront, where we had lots of nice food and a bottle of wine. By the time we were done, though, it was already dark out. We were both knackered, so we started to head back to the hotel. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm pretty useless with getting my orientation in a new place. Usually, I have to rely on Google Maps or City Mapper to get me anywhere. We were walking up the street and overshot the street where the hotel was by about a hundred meters, so we stopped and decided to cross over at the pedestrian lights. All of a sudden, there was a man right next to us, looking fairly shady. As we cross over, we see him hanging around a woman on a corner. We later realized that yes, she was touting for business. Another guy appears out of nowhere. I stopped for a second to roll a cigarette, as Mum wasn't too happy about being that close to these guys. I happily obliged, as they were giving off strange vibes to me as well. My spotty senses were tingling all around. We carried on walking, and I noticed that they kept looking back at us. If I lifted off using my crutch, one of the guys would look around to see where we were. I told my mum to cross over to the other side, as that's usually a pretty good sign to tell if someone is potentially trying to follow or keep track of where you are. Again, they looked around and followed us. Now by this point, we were no more than 50 meters from the driveway entrance to the hotel, the only one on this street, and I rightly guess they realized we were staying there. The second guy that appeared suddenly walked down a driveway next to our hotel, and the first one stopped, hanging around to see us walk past. At this point, I noticed the driveway to our hotel isn't lit, so neither me nor my mom are comfortable walking to the hotel whilst these two guys are hanging around it. You ever feel like you're being hunted? Well, that's exactly how I was feeling in that moment. I say to my mom in her native language for us to keep walking and see what happens. Suddenly, the guys speed up right next to us and start trying to figure out which language we're speaking. It ended up with, Hey, want to come back to my place? We're having a party. Just come back with us. I'm a female in my late 20s, and my mum is nearly 60. As you can probably tell, my gut feeling was telling me to note the fuck out of there ASAP. We turned down a street, and my mum was totally panicking about how we're going to get back into the hotel if they're still hanging around. I had a feeling, though, these guys were fairly opportunistic, and wouldn't wait around as I'd made sure we didn't make it look like we were going anywhere but forwards, just ignoring them. A half an hour later, we walk up a main road that's a little better lit and get to the turning of our hotel street, in addition to seeing an additional three ladies looking to make their money that night. Out of the corner of my eye, I spot the first man waiting around. Fuck, that's all I can think. I told my mom to speed up, despite not being able to run. I assure you, though, I had my crutch at the ready to start swinging if they came after us. All of a sudden, the first man starts whistling to his friend, signaling that we were back. Cue speed walking as fast as my dodgy knee can carry me, and punching the hotel gate code in as fast as possible. We pretty much didn't so much as breathe until we finally made it into the lobby. The night manager greets us, and we retell our story, with my mum visibly shaking, the poor woman. We get told, nothing like that has ever happened around here before. Ah, uh, yeah, right, mate. We saw four prostitutes, and the streets are deserted. At least acknowledge this happened instead of brushing it off. In hindsight, we should have just called the emergency line for that country, but as we couldn't prove they were doing anything, we didn't think it would make much of a difference. The rest of the week, we just ate big lunches out, and then as soon as it started getting dark, we chilled in the hotel room with snacks and wine and films instead of going out. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that's ever happened to me. I've never been so petrified in my entire life. Even to this day, I still don't know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I first saw him. Also, I'm sorry for how long the geographical description is. 
I just want everyone to understand just how secluded I was when this all happened, and how badly it could have all ended if it wasn't for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in nearly a year after starting uni. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town, with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest, and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests around here very well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles of walking. At that point, the stream was hidden quite deeply into the forest. I continued to walk north and followed the stream through the forest to get to the river, then followed the river out west to get to the lake. It's very easy to get lost because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down and crests over hills, and you eventually end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone, or with my dad over the span of 18 years, and never once had I seen anybody else in that forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone. Ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I managed to reach the stream after only an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, the sound coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found very strange. I listened well. I wondered if maybe it was a lost hunting dog, and I started to move towards the sound. Yeah, I bloody know I'd be the first person to die, but I was heading north anyway, so what the hell? At that point, I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving, and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. I knew that the stream wasn't big or strong enough to carry something like a bell trapped in a tin that could make that noise, and the river was far too still. I tried to think of everything, but nothing could explain the sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it, though, and just went on my normal way. That was until I found a badger, a bloomin' dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp, and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, and so had I. The badger was put there, maybe killed there at least decapitated, while I was walking that way. I suppose. I don't know, really. Thankfully, nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at about 6 p.m. that night. I'd made it to the stream and then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I came, because it was getting quite late, and it was starting to rain really heavily. The sun had set at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while, through the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, with his head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like a ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree, almost like a literal load of bollocks. It was a putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping with green liquid. I started to gag. I had some sort of mucus-textured fluid stuck in my hair. It was completely repulsive feeling. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. 
Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in the juices. I was soaking from the rain, and my senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone who knew I'd see it. Was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not just animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running and half walking away from the stream, back towards the path for a while, when I began to hear the bell once again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part to me, to go as fast as he could, and that someone was with me in the forest. I can't quite explain the feeling I had. It was like I just shit out my intestines and stomach. I could literally feel the hairs on my neck raise, despite being completely soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking, because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. Because of the rain, every single sound around me was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on way longer than the last time, on and off. It felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear, combined with my compromised hearing, and the fact that I couldn't breathe properly, was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what the flip I was even doing. I was breathing like a goddamn horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing these sounds around me, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was so terrified that I went into survival mode. At this point, I slowed down because I was beginning to run out of breath. Then, I heard branches break. Clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest. The bell began to ring louder. I didn't want to, but I turned and looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure, creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability, or if it was instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as loud as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path already. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell out, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping, wheezing, crying and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched off. I just ran. At some point, I even dropped my bag and I only realized I didn't have it anymore when I had reached the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Everything no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the sound of the bell approaching from behind. I finally heard my dad shout out my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation in his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad could hear the bell too. My mom could hear it over the phone. She was waiting with the car, ready to leave in an instant. We went directly to the police station, and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car. He said that the entire time, he could hear the bell, and he thought he wouldn't be able to see me. He asked himself, what if I didn't have my phone? What if he hadn't picked up? They were almost as terrified as me, because they had been witness to everything through the call. They could hear me running. They could hear the danger, they just couldn't see it. The police, of course, couldn't really do much. They searched the area, and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. My bag was not recovered. 
They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest, but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and exactly where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone, of course. The entire thing was my fault. There are just so many what-ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable, and they felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was something more insidious? The way the man moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse, because of how slowly and deliberately he was ringing the bell. It was like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more detail. I just ran. To this day, I can't bloody go anywhere where I'll be alone, and the sounds of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life, so go hug yours right now, and take decapitated badgers and bells as pagan signs that you're unwelcome. So I've had quite a few bad experiences with strange people, and my house. From when I was young, an old man would come banging on our door late at night, demanding to see me, causing me to have to hide in the house and not be allowed into my garden alone for years. Or the one time a man came knocking on our door late at night with a knife because he mistook our house for my neighbors. These experiences all caused me to be very cautious about opening the front door to anyone, or even being in the house alone in general, especially at night. But one evening was definitely the worst. It was around 6pm in October of 2018. I'm from England, meaning it was already pitch black outside at this time of year. I had just gotten home from work, and was sat in my room upstairs just watching YouTube on my laptop, my mom shouted up to me that she was going to pick my brother up from work and would be stopping off at the petrol station on the way back. She would be gone for a little bit and asked if I wanted to come. I said no though and carried on with my videos. I heard her close the front door and pull out of the driveway. I was 17 at the time so being home alone at night was nothing new to me and I was used to the eerie feeling of it. But after around 10 minutes, I started to hear noises coming from downstairs. At first, I thought nothing of it, and just related it to my cat noisily searching for food in an empty bowl, until I remembered he was sitting there at the edge of my bed. I paused my video and listened harder at the sound of the banging on the back door. This instantly creeped me out, until it was followed by the sound of keys jangling. I just thought, oh, mom must have dropped off my brother before going to the petrol station, and he's just trying to go outside. I let the noise continue as I kept watching my video. He can get quite angry sometimes, so the loud banging was nothing out of the ordinary, but it just kept carrying on. Banging, and the sounds of keys jangling, then dropping, then the banging again. The fear really hit me. I don't think that's him. I walked out of my room slowly, and sat on the stairs listening carefully to the noise. It definitely wasn't him. I'm a very anxious person, and everyone gets those times late at night when they hear noises and immediately think the worst. This was just one of those I told myself, so I decided to bite the bullet and just walk straight into the kitchen and face whatever it was causing the noise. Our kitchen has the door straight to the garden. As I turned a corner into the kitchen though, I heard a loud bang and the clattering of footsteps running away. The cat flap had been ripped off the door, and there was plastic from it everywhere. In fear, I tried to console myself into thinking it could be anything other than someone trying to break in. I sat back on the stairs and called my mom, just to check again that it wasn't my brother home early and just in a bad mood. But then he answered my mom's phone, while still in the car. Are you at home? I shouted at him. No, he said back moodily. Then my voice started to break with terror. Please be serious. Are you at home right now? Even though he said he wasn't, I still begged in my mind that he was joking just to get a scare out of me. But he could hear how scared I was, and he began to worry as well. I explained to him what had happened, and he started screaming at me to call the police. He's never been the protective type, so I could tell now he was really worried. 
Whilst dialing 999, I tried hard to stay calm. I told them exactly what was happening as I hid back in my room with the door tightly locked. Then I heard talking and the banging of doors again downstairs. They were back. I burst into tears to the dispatcher out of pure fear and sat on the phone for what felt like forever until my mom, brother, and police all pulled up at the same time. Everyone charged through the house through the back door, and we instantly saw what they'd done. The people saw the keys to the back door on the side, took a broom from outside, broke it in half on the door handle, and got the broom through the cat flap. They'd knocked the keys off and pulled them through the cat door. Out of pure luck, as they broke the broom in half, they also managed to snap off the door handle, making it impossible for it to be opened from outside. Otherwise, they would have gotten in no questions asked, and I would have just been sat silently in my room completely oblivious. Side note, always keep your keys in a place that someone breaking a window or cat flap can reach. It was clear afterwards that they'd been watching our house for a while, waiting until the exact moment they saw my mom's car pull out of the drive. I'm not sure if they knew I was there alone or not. I worked at a boxing slash MMA gym almost 20 years back, essentially as a receptionist. We were deep in the ghetto. I almost didn't take the job because of the neighborhood's reputation, but the friend who recommended the place said it was the most fulfilling office work I'd ever find, so I gave it a try. And it turns out, he was right. Before working there, I thought I'd grown up lower middle class and that I'd become pretty broke at that point in my life. And compared to the quality of life in our community, though, I was Bill Gates. The school-to-prison pipeline was the standard around here, and we accepted that it was bigger than all of us. We were just trying to divert as many kids away from it as we could. As a result, our biggest program was a teen MMA class that met every night except Sundays to help keep our kids off the streets. We had one kid from that program who was a total wild card. Cisco had been coming in since he was four years old, and in our after-school fitness program, then he had risen through the ranks to actually become one of our trainers, and even a semi-professional fighter. But as professional and disciplined as he was inside the gym, he could be as wild and unhinged outside. There was just too much going on at home. At the time of this incident, he had just turned 16. We had one fitness instructor, Chandra, who knew everything there was to know about physiology, nutrition, and all things exercise. She was as dumb as a brick, though, when it came to common sense. She was always getting roped into MLM-type stuff back when they were still called pyramid schemes. We had poached her from a fancy franchise gym on the other side of town. The owner found out she'd grown up around here and guilt-tripped her into coming home. Whenever we had rich-looking prospective clients, we always sent her to pitch them instead of our usual outreach people. Finally, there was Alsis. Alsis was the golden child of our Beat the Streets program. Growing up in one of the roughest parts of town, one sibling murdered and two in prison, but she was still in school getting straight A's and applying to colleges for that next year as well. She came in basically every day when we opened and stayed every night until we closed. She never spoke a word and couldn't make eye contact with anyone she hadn't already known for years. But that was fine. We just let her work in the office on her own time. I'm only telling you this so you can understand everyone's personality and why they reacted the way they did when the day finally came. On this day, I was just setting in for a lunch break. It was the middle of the day on a Sunday. The neighborhood was super Christian, so we weren't officially open on Sundays. We kept the facilities running, but we didn't have any classes or anything. We just unlocked the place in case anyone wanted to come by or really needed a place to go. Cisco was there, which was a relief to me because if he wasn't, he was usually out somewhere that he probably shouldn't be. Chandra had just had a personal training client in the gym who'd left, so she was getting ready to leave too. Alsis was repainting our bathroom, 
I didn't really need repainting, but she wanted to make some extra money that she really did need. Cisco didn't have a reason to be there other than to not be somewhere else, but we always wanted to give the kids a sense of purpose, and he was our doorman that day. Usually, we really do always have someone watching the door, because sometimes randos walked in, mostly pickpockets or homeless people looking for money, skeevy guys casing the place out, whatever. Every business on the block had someone posted by the door to turn them around at the threshold and make sure the place had a reputation as vigilantly watched, so not worth the effort to hassle. Most of us hated guarding the door, but the young guys loved it. It made them feel tough in a way that was productive, I suppose. So, we had Cisco there posted up. He wasn't really paying attention, but it was a Sunday afternoon. No reason he really should have to. He was there crumpling up pieces of paper and trying to hit Chandra in the head with them, in a very playful way while she sat there doing some exercises. I was just eating my lunch filling out invoices. It couldn't have been a more average afternoon at that point. Then the door chimed. We had a convenience store style buzzer on it, so whoever was in charge could be on notice if someone new entered. A man shuffled in. He looked average at first glance, but I could feel something about his energy was off. I usually greeted clients from behind the desk, but without even thinking, I stood up right away and asked, Can I help you? In a sharp tone, taking a step out from behind the desk, my spine was just tingling. The man looked me up and down, eyes flashing a little. He had kind of a limp, but it was his only distinct feature. Other than that, he was just wearing a normal t-shirt and jeans. I kept looking at him hard to try and figure out what it was about him that was making me so uncomfortable. He didn't say anything at first, so I repeated it again a little more firmly and loud. Yo, can I help you with something? He just stood there, kind of staring past me. Cisco finally tuned in and stood up, drawing his shoulders back and telling the man, Alright man, look, we're closed. He gestured out the door. I knew he must have sensed something too, because even on his worst days, he was always friendly when facing public unless given an overt reason not to be. The man's face twisted up, and he asked, Where's Paolo? Fuck if I knew. We don't have a Paolo. You've got the wrong place. But he wasn't buying it. He clenched his fists and started saying, kind of breathing heavy, I want to talk to Paolo. It kind of clicked for Cisco at that point, because he'd been here longer than me. Oh, look, man. He hasn't worked here in like five years. We can't help you. The man didn't seem to process it though. I wasn't here that far back, so I didn't know what they were talking about at this point. The man looked Cisco dead in the eye and screamed. Don't fuck with me. Paolo knows what I'm owed, and I'm not leaving till I get it. So what's up? Chandra must have heard that through her headphones, because she stopped her cool down and came over from across the room to see what was going on. Cisco didn't take too kindly to the shouting, and would never admit to this, but he was definitely rattled by any unexpected loud noises or yelling. I think it had something to do with his troubled family life. Anyways, he was pissed from being screamed at, and immediately went to physically escort the man out. He wasn't the best at de-escalation off the cuff, but I also can barely blame him because often just throwing these guys out on the curb and locking the door was the most efficient way to deal with them. I couldn't put it out of my head that something about the whole situation was really off though. We bounced two or three people a week, and I'd never gotten a full body visceral reaction like this one. I could tell my mind was trying to tell me something. The guy had some nervous tics. He kept resting his hand on his hip a lot, but I thought it was just because his pants were baggy like a lot of guys around here. You may be wondering why I, the adult, was letting the teenage kid do our bouncing for us. The answer is simple. I don't know anything about fighting at all. I was working there doing administrative stuff. I've never even thrown a punch in my entire life. Where the fuck do you think you are right now? You better check yourself the next time you come through these doors. I said we're closed. He went to physically throw the man out, but that's when I saw it. The man was grabbing for a bulge. 
He had a limp, touching his hip a lot, a distinct bulge on the same side. They trained us for these signs. This man was armed. Cisco, step back! I tried to warn him, but it was too late. He wasn't listening to me, because he phased everything else out when he felt disrespected. I'd seen him do it in the ring a hundred times. I'd heard stories of it getting him into trouble outside as well. But now, was he about to get us all killed? Even in the ring, he never won the fights where he did that. Think what? Think what? Think what? The guy asked as he pulled the gun out and started waving it around. Nobody leaves. Nobody leaves until Paolo pays up, he announced, almost laughing as he said it. Thankfully, whether it was instinct, common sense, or a miraculous combination of the two, Cisco put his hands up right away and stepped back. I was more worried about what he would or wouldn't do than I was about the man with the gun. We had almost lost Cisco before when he tried to bring a knife to a gunfight just earlier that year. This guy here was clearly mentally unstable. I'm not trying to prove he was the biggest, toughest guy on the street, but I didn't know if Cisco was mature enough to differentiate between movie-style bad guys and reality-style mentally ill crackheads. Chandra wasn't even approaching cool or collected. I wasn't worried about her trying some hero play, but what she did instead wasn't a whole lot better. She saw the gun and just lost her mind. She started screaming at the top of her lungs, just shrieking, flipping out, literally just, literally just screaming. Of course, I did nothing. I mean nothing. I didn't put my hands up, didn't step back, didn't go to help the kid. I didn't even tell Chandra to shut up. I just stood there, and I froze in shock. To make matters worse, her yelling was aggravating the man. Sisko saw that and very evenly and calmly started saying, Chandra, Chandra, hey, excuse me, Chandra, no, not helping, breathe, I need you to breathe, hun. There was a plus side to Chandra's screams, though. It got Alsa's attention from the back in the bathroom. I caught her ever so gently shutting the door from the corner of my eye. Thankfully, the man didn't. I was trying to think of something to say or do. I'm embarrassed to even admit it now, but honestly, I was trying to remember hostage scenes from movies. I just drew a complete blank. All I could think about was how I'd always wanted to take my dad to a Bronco Super Bowl, and that I might die before I ever got the chance. For some reason, that clouded all my thinking about how to potentially not die and kept me from assessing the reality. Even now, it's still my clearest memory of the ordeal. At least I knew exactly what not to do. It wasn't because of any special expertise or presence of mind. Raw survival instinct kicked in. If I felt myself going to do or say something that could set the gunman off, my body physically overrode my mind and wouldn't allow me to. I was paralyzed with fear, but I suppose it was a healthy fear. Cisco, realizing how totally ineffectual I'd become, stepped up to the plate once again. He spoke calmly and slowly from the start, but like I said, Cisco was a wild card. I was petrified to have him running this, not knowing if he'd be sweet-talking one minute and lunging for the gun or saying something to antagonize the man another. You want to talk to Paolo, right? Just let me go get him, okay? Cisco offered. The man thought about it for a second and agreed. All right, I'm going to go and call for him for you now, okay? No phones. No, no, no. The man started muttering. I realized with it being Sunday, it could realistically be 24 hours before anyone came into the building or started actionably wondering where any of us were. I was too scared to fully dismay at that additional layer of chaos, though. I think Cisco had planned to call somebody other than Paolo, because I could see the disappointment on his face. Hey, man. How can I get in touch with him for you if you won't let me call him? Shut up! I'm thinking! The man shouted, kicking over a display stand in a burst of rage. This startled Chandra into crying. Shut up. Shut up! Just shut up! He started pacing back and forth. Sisko visibly flinched at the screaming, but soldiered forward nonetheless. Hey, I'm Sisko. Do you have something I can call you? The man paused for a second obviously carefully considering his answer. Just call me Troy, but don't talk to me. Where is he? He had just told Sisko not to talk to him, yet also asked him a direct question. 
That was too much even for him. The survival instinct forced me to start forming some sentences. My voice was cracked and barely audible, but it was coherent enough. So, uh, Troy, was it? Uh, he, uh, Paolo, uh, it sounds like, uh, he doesn't work here. But what do you need from him? Uh, maybe, uh, I can help you instead. I told myself over and over in my head to just treat him like any other disgruntled client and rely on the script. That was muscle memory. I could literally recite it with a gun to my temple. He knows what he owes me. I had no clue how to respond to that. But hey, at least he wasn't shouting anymore. Can't you tell us what Paolo owes you? Uh, maybe we can help. No. No, 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 no. I want to deal with him directly. Where is he? Cisco told him again that we could help him if he just explained what he wanted. It continued like that in a circle for 30 or 40 minutes more. Long silences in between where Troy both cried and tried punching through a wall unsuccessfully. Suddenly the phone rang. He didn't like that one bit. What is that? He asked, as though weed somehow made it ring. The phone, I explained, each word taking my breath away. Make it stop. By this point, he'd become comfortable enough with Cisco that he was letting him move around a little. They were chatting about baseball in some random neighborhood convenience store. He actually remained pretty level-headed as long as Chandra stopped asking him to just let her go or sobbing uncontrollably. Cisco went over, picked up the phone, and hung it back up. But within seconds, it was ringing once again. I said, make it stop. Troy bellowed, kicking at another stand. This one was weighted down with concrete, so he hurt his foot. That just made him angrier. He started waving the gun around wildly, chattering incoherently, rather than just holding it at his side like he had been. Needless to say, we were all very anxious to shut that phone off. We assumed it was some ornery parent calling to complain about their child's tuition charge coming through. We couldn't have guessed who it actually was. Cisco picked it up again and hissed, Stop calling. We're closed. Stop. He slammed it down again, but immediately it rang a third time. Troy pointed the gun in my general direction and put his finger right on the trigger, screaming. I said cut it off! Cisco ripped the phone cord out of the wall. It stopped. It stopped. You don't have to do anything, okay? You don't have to do anything. That whole sequence of having a gun pointed at me, only to be saved by a teenager's drastic action, felt as though I was watching it happen to someone else more than something that was happening to me. It still does, even looking back on it now. For whatever reason, Chandra thought the heels of this phone saga was the appropriate moment to try for the third or fourth time to talk her way out of the situation. That got him to move the gun away from me, at least. But it didn't help matters overall, either. She just kept saying, chattering so quickly you'd think she were on a tape on Fast Forward. So this really isn't working, right? I mean, you should probably just let all of us go. Or maybe just one of us right here, right? It's really the same effect. Or just leave. I mean, no one will ever know you were here. You can go look for Paolo and everything will be fine. This isn't working, so you should probably just let us go and then we can all leave and move on. I have a daughter and... Oh god, I love her so much. You have kids, right? You understand. I... I have to... I have to leave. I have to get out of here right now. I'm sorry, I just do. So please, just let me leave. You don't need me here for this. This made him extremely agitated, and Cisco had to shout over her to shut her up until she was hyperventilating in silence once again. Troy still hadn't tied us up or even forced us to lie down or anything. Like I said, he had actually let Cisco move around some, if he wasn't sudden about it. Cisco's overall goal was to keep the man calm, but every so often he kept trying to bring the conversation back to what he actually wanted so he could start working on convincing him to let us go. Every time, though, he would just say, If Paolo gives it up, we'll be fine. It'll be fine. But it's time for me to be a man right now because I'm done waiting. If we pressed him on what exactly he wanted, it would trigger a rage. He'd interpret it as us questioning whether or not he could have it. There's something along the lines of, I want what I'm owned. Don't try to act like I don't have this fucking coming. You know he's been holding out on me. 
and we tried to get across to him that it was in his best interest to be specific in his demands. If it was money, we'd just pay him. If it was drugs, Cisco probably had a hookup. If it was a woman, Chandra would replace her. If it wasn't something else, we'd figure out something else. Whatever it was, we were hoping once we knew we could start appealing to the molecule of rationale that was buried behind this decision making and begin negotiating a release. But every time we tried to figure it out, it just made it even worse. It seemed like he was getting angry at us that we didn't just already know. I had a sneaking suspicion that with the stress, pressure, and sudden burst of new information, even he wasn't sure what he wanted, and that was making him angry. I tried to help where I could, but it was really all I could do to not curl up on the ground and hyperventilate like Chandra. Worse, it turned out that was what Chandra did when she was relatively well composed. Eventually, she just cracked under the pressure. She decided she'd see what would happen if she just tried to get up and run out. She very nearly got shot. Only three things prevented her from getting killed. First of all, when Troy pointed the weapon at her, she sat her ass back on the ground where she stood. Secondly, Sisko instantly put himself between her and Troy when he realized a colossal mistake she was making. And third... Freeze! It's the police! Everybody down! Get down now! Those three calls earlier were not a complaining parent or telemarketer. It was the cops trying to make contact. When they couldn't, they knew so little about the situation, they eventually just decided to go in. And to my knowledge, Cisco didn't have any official record whatsoever, but I will say he knew exactly what would happen when the police came in, with a specificity none of us did. He laid down exactly how they wanted him to, was a step ahead of all their directions. The only light-hearted part of this all was holding that over his head after the dust settled. They cuffed all of us at first until they could determine who was perpetrating a crime and who was the victim of one. They subdued Troy with nothing more than pepper spray. Oh, life pro tip by the way. If you think someone's gonna be pepper sprayed, get the fuck away from them. That shit travels all through the air, even if it's not directed anywhere near your face. I was handcuffed when they sprayed him, so I couldn't even cover my eyes with my shirt or anything. Anyways, one of their tactical looking guys was helping us get uncuffed as they realized Troy was the only criminal. Hold it, hold it. I only count three. Where's the fourth? The caller reported a minimum of four victims, right? I was stupid enough to say in my peppery post-hostage haze, there was another girl. All they heard was, was, and immediately went to the worst case scenario. They deduced who the bad guy was by this point, and were cross-checking their notes, getting in Troy's face. Where is she, damn it? What did you do to her? Tell us right now or God help me. I composed myself enough to point towards the bathroom as it all came snapping back to me because of course Troy couldn't help them. He didn't even know what they were talking about. The police kicked the door down and there was Alsis just huddled in the corner, hysterical. It took everything she'd had just to stay silent through the whole thing, not knowing if everyone was okay or what was going on. She saved us. She had painted 911 on the window with her paint, and that's why the cops came. One of our owners spotted the 911 right away when he pulled up and called the police, giving them all the pertinent information about who was likely to be there that day. That neighborhood had so much crime, more sinister, targeted, and tragic than this, that our ordeal didn't get a whole lot of attention. Later that night, Three kids younger than Cisco were shot nearby in some gang thing, and the one or two people who wanted to report on what happened over here dropped our story to cover that instead. One of the responding officers was so touched by Alsa's quick thinking that he got his department to team up with his brother's small business to give her a very healthy college scholarship to commend her for her bravery. It was the final straw for Chandra, though. She went back to teaching on the other side of town within a couple of weeks of this happening. Out of courtesy, she'd still do a few personal training sessions here and there, but even that stopped after a while longer. I don't blame her whatsoever. I don't think anyone who was here for it does. Troy never clearly articulated what it was he actually wanted that day. We were never able to track down Paolo to ask if he even knew he owed Troy something or could blend any context. No one at work really talked about it much besides that either. 
I mean, it was all anyone talked about for about two days, but then everyone just moved on with their lives. I don't know how they did, because it was the single most petrifying thing I've ever experienced. Cisco was even able to look back and laugh about it just a couple of weeks later. But even though it's been years now, I still can't laugh about it. Not too long afterwards, I had to move, so I left the job. I miss the kids, and I don't miss the reality they were facing every day. This happened to me about six years ago now, on July 1st, 2014. In Canada, July 1st is a national holiday, and in Vancouver, where I'm from, there are always fireworks in English Bay at around 10 p.m. The bay is on the west side of the city, and is surrounded by a semicircle of beaches, which are all usually packed with locals enjoying the day off, and just taking in the scene of the fireworks. This means that public transport is slow particularly after 10.30 p.m., right around when the fireworks end. I had just finished up a big project and gotten a nice little bonus from work, so I spent the day out shopping with a friend, and then walked down to the nearest beach with her to meet up with a few others and watch the fireworks, smoke a joint on the side. Vancouver is a pretty bike-friendly city, and I normally bike everywhere, especially in nice weather but my friend's bike happened to have a broken chain on that day. We'd taken the bus to get out there, which meant we'd also be taking it back home. After the fireworks were over, we were lucky enough to catch one of the first buses towards the east side of the city, where we both lived. The trip took way longer than usual, because of both holiday traffic downtown, and the bus itself being packed with people wanting to get on and off at every single stop. By the time the bus had gotten us to our transfers, which was only about halfway home for both of us, the trip had already taken about an hour instead of the 20 minutes it usually took. Hastings Street is one of the main bus thoroughfares in Vancouver, served by at least 10 different bus routes. Most of the routes that run along Hastings use cable-style buses that are connected to overhead power lines. Uh, good for pollution, I guess, but if one of the buses with cable attachments gets stopped, it holds up every single other bus on the cable behind it. Sometimes you'll be waiting at a stop, see no buses for 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden five come out at once, stacked up right behind each other. East Hastings Street also contains a seedy section of town. Vancouver's safe injection site is there. There's a lot of open drug use, addiction, and prostitution. I have a lot of friends that work with social programs in the neighborhood or are nurses in the area. I've never once felt unsafe there at any point, but I just want to give you an idea of what my surroundings were. My friend and I lived maybe only 15 blocks apart at the time, but the fastest way home for each of us was served by two different routes that both stopped pretty much outside our respective rentals. After making sure I would be okay on my own, my friend grabbed her bus home, and I waited there for mine to show. It was about midnight at this point. After about 30 minutes, though, I was starting to get very tired of waiting, and also just tired in general. No buses were showing up, it was getting really late, and I just wanted to get home. I saw a cab happen to come down the street, by some miracle still empty. I hailed it over and got in. I told the driver my address, and we drove in silence for a few minutes. As we started passing through a particularly rough stretch of Hastings, my driver started talking to me. Look at all these people, he said. Thinking he was talking about holiday partiers, I agreed that it was a pretty busy night. No, he said. Look at all these sluts and whores. Look at all these dirty people selling it out on the street. These are all worthless women. I was pretty shocked. I didn't say anything. He carried on his tirade for another couple of minutes before abruptly stopping mid-sentence and falling completely silent. He made eye contact with me in the rearview mirror and whispered, but you don't have to worry about that. You're a good girl. 
It creeped the hell out of me and made me want to get out of that cab immediately. And traffic was pretty light at this point, and up ahead a couple of blocks, I could see that there was a police road check. I decided it would be a good idea to get out there, since he'd have to stop anyway, or at least slow down enough that I wouldn't get hurt getting out of the car. And before I could put my plan into action, though, he veered off onto a side street, then onto a street running parallel to Hastings. And we were still heading east, but we were now further south, turning away from my house. At this point, I was feeling kind of panicky. I asked him if he could turn back on to Hastings, since we were now heading far away from my address. He said he couldn't. I asked him why, and he said, There's too much traffic there. This route will be faster. As he said this, though, he locked all the doors and made eye contact with me once again in the mirror, saying in a strange, joking kind of voice. Plus, if we stopped at that road check, we'd have to tell them what's going on in here, and we don't want that. I was terrified. I blurted out, so what the fuck is happening here? But he didn't answer me. He kept driving in silence, smiling strangely at me in the rear view. I'm a pretty anxious person already, and I don't like cab rides late at night in general, but I was pretty sure I wasn't overreacting. It even crossed my mind that he might want to kill me. There were only a few cars, but the sidewalks were completely empty, and we were now in an industrial area of town, with warehouses, and no reason for people to ever be out on the street this late at night. The street curved, and thankfully, there was another police road check that had been hidden just out of view, pretty much right in front of us. It was on a one-way street, and both lanes had checks on them, with the cops waving some cars through, and motioning for others to pull over. This meant there was a bit of backup in both lanes, and no way to avoid it. I undid my seatbelt and started to grab for the door handle. The driver saw me. Don't even think about it. Don't even roll down the window. If we get stopped at the road check, don't say a word or else. Well, of course I didn't listen to any of that. I just unlocked the door, yanked it open at the same time, and sprinted across a lane of traffic to a gas station on the other side of the street, crying the whole way. I had left all my purchases in the cab, and he didn't even stick around to get his fare. He just sped away after getting waved through the road check. In my fear, I didn't think to get the number of the cab, and now, years later, I can't even remember which company it was. I wish I had said something to the cops at the roadblock, but I was shaking and just wanted to go home, lock my doors and windows, and crawl into bed. I don't know if the driver was just worried about me skipping out on my fare, or if something more sinister was going on, but from time to time I still think about it. I always make sure I have a plan to get home that doesn't involve a taxi if I'm out and it's getting late. Long time lurker, first time poster. You know how it goes. This happened to me a few years ago. I was chatting with a friend about this story last night and thought it would be the perfect let's not meet submission. About five years ago, I went to a house party for a friend of a friend who had just purchased a new home. I was freshly 20 and ready to get my drink on. My friend Sam and I had pre-drinks at my apartment and walked over to the party. It was raging when we got there. Luckily, we arrived just on time to watch some drunk asshole fall into the fire. He was okay, thankfully. This drunk ass's friend walks over to Sam and I and starts to chat us up. Sam knows this guy, Kyle, from the couple who just bought the house. And Kyle gave off this kind of creepy, clingy vibe. He kept touching my arm while talking to me, and he said my name every single sentence. So, what's your favorite drink, my name? So, my name, you live around here, huh? Eventually, we managed to carefully disentangle ourselves from Kyle and went inside to chat with the rest of the girls at the party. We were inside at the table joking around when the guys came in from outside to complain that we weren't out there with them. Every party needs its beautiful girls, shouts Kyle as he stared directly into my eyes. The girls as a whole complained that it was too chilly out and the fire wasn't big enough to throw much heat into the yard. I was sitting at the table. 
I think a high bar table with tall chairs, when Kyle came over and planted himself directly between my legs. He then started talking right up against my face. I was super uncomfortable, so I backed up and told him he was a little too close. Kyle didn't move, but he noticed that I was without a drink. He offered to get me a beer, and I said, sure, thinking he was just going to bring me a closed can or a bottle. Nope. Kyle went into the back room of the kitchen, fumbled his beer box, opened the beer, and brought it to me. I said thanks, accepted the already opened beer, and placed it down on the table. I had no intentions of drinking an already opened beer from this creepy dude. I managed to sneak away with a handful of girls for a house tour, and left Kyle upstairs with the rest of the party. The girls told me they'd noticed that Kyle, who they like to call Turtle colloquially, due to his appearance, was really focusing in on me, and that I shouldn't do anything to lead him on. I assured them that I was not trying to lead Kyle on, and I was doing my best to just graciously fend off his advances. We finished the tour and headed back to the kitchen for more drinks. And Kyle noticed that I was beerless once again. He pressed another already opened beer into my hand. Drink up, beautiful, he said, staring dead into my eyes. I pressed the beer up to my lips and pretended to swallow. I got up with the beer and walked to a couch. I discreetly hid the beer on the floor behind the coffee table. This went on for an hour. Kyle continued to notice I was without a drink and kept pressing these open beers into my hand. I kept walking around, leaving open beers in various places in the house and never drinking them. Finally, Sam came to me and said she wanted to go home. Thank God. We were in the back room in the kitchen getting our shoes on when Kyle walked over. He took my hand and said, Give me your number. I can't believe I got to spend so much time with such a babe tonight. I'd love to get to know you more. Kyle said this in the most cold, monotone voice while staring deep into my eyes. I had chills. I pulled my hand out of his and said, Give me your number. I'll text you sometime. With zero intention of ever putting the number into my phone or texting this psychopath. I was honestly afraid of what would happen to me if I outright said no to him. There was something empty and cold about his eyes. Kyle took my phone, though, and put himself into my contacts. He looked at Sam and said, Hey, uh, any chance you could give us a minute? I'd like to say goodnight properly. Kyle grabbed my waist hard and pulled me towards him. Sam, God bless her, took the other side of my waist, spun me around, and said, No can do. This is my girl right here. She's got to take my drunk ass home. Kyle glared at her with a cold fury. The phrase, if looks could kill, comes to mind. Kyle was still holding my phone and texts himself from it so he has my number. He hands my phone back without a word, spins on his heel and leaves Sam and I alone in this dark room. We leave, thankfully without incident. Kyle texted me steadily throughout the night. He started 15 minutes after I left the party, until I blocked his number the next day. They started off innocently enough. Hey, how are you? Did you get home alright? I miss your beautiful face. He started to get a bit aggressive when I wouldn't reply though, texting me things like, Fuck you, you stupid cunt. Answer me. I blocked him, and thought nothing of it for about two years. My group of friends had long distanced themselves from Kyle and we never crossed paths again. Two years later though, almost to the day, Kyle was arrested for stabbing his then girlfriend to death. He stabbed her over 100 times. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, the student community at UCSB, notorious for being a party school. It lived fully up to its reputation. I like to party, but holy shit, these people were off the wall. As such, there was a lot of people who would put themselves in dangerous situations. Drinking to excess, not being careful, not locking doors. It had a very isolated and insular vibe, and anyone who was hanging around who wasn't college-aged immediately looked out of place and strange. 
One night, after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house, where I lived with two other girls at probably around 2.30 a.m. We were all serious students. I was actually probably the least serious out of all of us. When we partied, it wasn't your typical UCSB mega-rager. More like a small get-together with some friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep on our furniture, in our beds, as the case may be. That night, my roommates had had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there. I didn't turn on the light, though, so that I wouldn't wake anyone up. As I was passing by the couch to enter my bedroom, though, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and rigid as possible. I paused, and the man quickly jerked his head to face me, without moving his limbs, so quickly that it actually startled me. I could see his wide open eyes, glinting in the dark. Figuring that I'd startled him, that he might be drunk, or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep, I hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me nervous, and I wasn't taking any chances. I managed to fall asleep. At 4.30 a.m., though, I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds, like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder, until it was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone out and texted my roommate, because I was too afraid to make any noise. Hey, your friend is freaking me out, dude. Is he coked out or something? Can you go talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back, probably because she was still asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect, covering all my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching had been going on at this point for a couple of minutes. I had no idea how he could have sustained it. Scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel good at all. He also grabbed at the knob and started to jiggle it super forcefully. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and really wake them up, though I was scared to make a sound still. I know this sounds stupid, but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid, but I could tell the guy was fucked up or something, and maybe the police needed to be called. I wanted to loop my roommates in, since they were my friends as well. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up. Can you please deal with it? Like, do we need to call the cops or something? He's seriously scaring me, and he was scratching at my bedroom door. It's really fucking weird. She didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she did speak, there was suddenly no sleepiness in her voice at all. What friend? She said. That guy that was sleeping on the couch. She was quiet again. We didn't have any guys over. Call the police now. My adrenaline surged, and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized I hadn't heard the scratching in a while, and I had no clue where the man could have gone. I heard a loud banging in the other end of the house, where my roommates Lauren and Monica shared a bedroom. The banging was followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. I quickly dialed the police as this maniac proceeded to bang against the luckily locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt. He was trying to break the door down. I told the 911 operator the situation, and she dispatched two cars right away. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to peeling drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawling frat bros. This was really serious and strange, and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone how terrified we were. She stayed on the phone with me the whole time. At one point, the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I was talking with the dispatcher 
when I looked down to see that the man had slipped his fingers to the one inch gap between my door and the floor and was just kind of waggling them around, making this strange sound. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about this situation, since when I look back on it now, it would have been awesome to just stomp the shit out of those fingers and hear the man scream in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing. Then, he was gone. The cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what appeared to be huge gouges that he'd made using a pair of scissors that he'd left discarded on the ground before he ran. What terrifies me the most is that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realize now that he wasn't trying to sleep or on drugs, but he was lying so still like that because he was trying to hide. He probably heard me opening the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there. He was trying to blend into the couch in the darkness. Some background before I begin. This isn't my story. It's my grandmother's. She told me this story after I shared an equally horrific tale of my own, which I will post someday soon. Anyway, I figure I should tell you guys my grandmother is a part of the time period when lots of Southerners were migrating to the northern states, looking for work and better pay to help out their families, all still living down south. This journey took her to New York, where she found seamstress work and where the story takes place. I should also add that my grandmother is one tough old bird, and she's very paranoid about people she doesn't really know, and situations that she has no control over. So this story came as quite a shock to me, and kind of explains a little about why she might be so paranoid now. I'll also add that she does not, and has never taken anyone's shit. She's about five foot nine, had muscles in her 60s, still rocks a crew cut, and would kick some ass whenever necessary. She's not your typical granny at all, so if something scares her, it's really fucking scary. My grandmother and her friend Judy worked right down the street from each other. They were introduced by my grandmother's boss and hit it off pretty well. They started to hang out very frequently after work. My grandma said that one night, they went to a bar and were having a good old time, and it was here that the men approached them. There were two of them, one tall, light-skinned man, and a shorter, dark-skinned man. And Judy seemed to know them, and seemed very happy to see them. She introduced them to my grandmother, and so they all decided to hang out for the evening. After a while of drinking and having a good time in the bar, the men started asking Judy if her and her beautiful friend would like to come back to their house to continue the party since the bar was since the bar was going to close very soon. My grandma declined, as she's always been paranoid. She said the men were giving off creepy vibes all night, doing things like whispering when they thought she and Judy weren't paying attention, giving the general creeper stare that us women become accustomed to noticing, and the shorter dark man kept trying to touch my grandma's waist and wrist. She said he was ugly as hell, and that he looked like an old screw-faced beagle, in her own words. He was so short that she practically towered over him. At one point, he tried to hold her hand, and she gave him her patent, I'll fucking kill you look, and he let go. The tall man persisted with the after-party idea, saying they could go play cards and dance some more, at their big, nice house. He promised that others would be there as well to party and play cards. Judy, by this time, was tanked, and the man had her convinced. She didn't want to go without my grandma, though, so she proceeded to beg my grandma to come with her. She tells my grandma to stop being so paranoid and to just trust her that these guys are her friends and that it's all okay, so against my grandma's better judgment, she left with them. She says they drove for a good while, and the moment she looked out the car window and didn't recognize anything at all, and asked the tall men where they were going, 
and all he said was upstate, that she was probably in trouble. The two men sat in the front, and her and Judy were in the back. Judy was telling my grandmother to chill out. They were all going to have a good time. So they get there, and turns out the guys didn't lie. They pull up in front of a nice big house in some suburb. They go inside, and Grandma says she remembers the front door led them into a long, dimly lit hallway. They were all walking single file down this hallway, in this order. The tall man, Judy, Grandma, and the short man behind them. She said that at the end of the hallway, there was a door which they went to, and the tall man had to stop to open it with a key. She saw a big rat in a spare room off the hall run across a dirty mattress with horrible brown stains all over it. She says this is what initially creeped her out about the house. The stains looked like dried blood, and it was the only thing in the room, just lying in the middle of the barren floor. They're all waiting for the tall man to open the door, and my grandmother is two seconds away from losing her shit. The door finally opens, and here's where the story gets scary as fuck. My grandma said she barely got a glimpse into the room. The door pulled out towards them, so she could see through the crack in between the door where its hinges and the frame meet as it opened wider. There were women of all ages in the nude, lingerie and garters, laying all over furniture playing cards and smoking cigarettes with men. She could hear people screaming. Grandma screamed and turned to run, knocking the short man down in the process. She says she was so much taller than him that she barely noticed that she had bowled him over. The tall man, though, had already grabbed Judy, who was now screaming too, and with the help of another man, shoved her inside the room with the other woman and slammed the door closed. They turned to help the short man chase my grandma down. She could hear them behind her yelling, Catch that bitch! She thought they would kill her when they caught her. She managed to get down the hall and out the door, as she ran down the street screaming because she didn't know where she was or where a train station was to get away. They chased her the entire way. Thankfully, though, she ran into a kind old man who was opening a newsstand by the grace of God. He asked her what was going on, and when she pointed out the men that were following her, he pulled out a gun and started yelling at them to get the fuck out of there. They hightailed it back to wherever. The newsstand man helped her find a train station, and gave her money so she could get back to the city. My grandma never saw Judy again. Her boss told her one day that a nice-looking, light-skinned brother came and picked up all of Judy's belongings from her place of work, which was also where she lived. Said he told them Judy wouldn't be returning to work and had found a new place to live. In a nutshell, my grandma avoided being abducted into a human trafficking ring, she says this has been going on for longer than the world wants to admit or know. For those of you who ask, like I asked my grandma, why she didn't call the police, you have to understand, my grandma didn't know where they took her, or if she had been given real names at all. She also didn't know the address, or anything really that would have helped find Judy. Also, being from Alabama back then, she didn't have much faith that anything would be helped by the police, and was afraid of them and what the men might do to her for meddling. She says she wishes she could have just convinced Judy not to go, and for a long time, she felt guilty about being the only one who got away. I'm glad she did, though. I might not exist if they had caught her. Hey, guys. This is my first post here, and English is not my native language, so please be patient with me. This isn't the creepiest story of all time. It just stuck with me because I'll never know what happened afterwards. I'm a small, skinny female student in my late 20s who works part-time as a waitress. It's usual for me to walk home late at night, and my town is not known for much crime. Nothing really ever happened to me here, but sometimes I had strange encounters with customers at the bar I was working at. Those stories are for a more suitable subreddit, though. It was about four in the morning a few weeks ago on a Monday, 
walking home from my late night shift on Sunday. I read a lot of stories here, and so I'm always aware of my surroundings. I don't like that some random customer would know my address or where I live, so I like to take different routes to my apartment. I was on one of the main streets of the city, but it was very late, and the city is quite small. It happens often that I don't even see a single person on the way home. Suddenly I heard yelling all over the street. Since I was alone, small, and not very strong, I walked slower and hid behind a wall. I tried to figure out where the noise was coming from, and there I saw them. A seemingly young couple, arguing heavily over something, in the middle of the road. I decided to keep hidden since I didn't know exactly what was going on. I dialed up the emergency number of my country, just in case I might need it in a few moments. I kept watching on because I had to pass this way no matter what. That's when he grabbed her hair and pulled it heavily. He was just beating her for a few seconds, right in the middle of the street. And the scene was over quickly, and they vanished from my side behind a big car, still yelling at each other. I thought about calling the police, but thought that there couldn't be a thing done, especially because they had stopped, and if you get involved in something like this, the woman will sadly often deny what happened. I was still hiding behind the wall, and I was quite torn. On one hand, there was nothing to report anymore. On the other hand, though, I felt responsible for the girl's safety. I tried to sneak a little closer, and the yelling stopped. I wasn't able to see them anymore. After waiting for about 30 seconds that felt like hours, I decided to continue on walking home, because there were nowhere to be seen. Instant regret is hitting me really hard, but I didn't know what this guy was capable of, or if he was carrying a weapon. Weapons aren't that common in my region, though. I told you, it's a safe town. I had to do something, so I turned back to where I last saw them. There was the girl, already walking fast towards me, hoodie down on her face. She clearly had a defensive body language, so I wasn't afraid of her. I could see her realizing that there was another person on the street who might be able to help. The man was still behind her apologizing to her. That was when he also saw me, and he stood still immediately. The girl was crying a little as she reached me. I could see she was way younger than me, and I tried to look as angry as possible at her attacker. The man got my look, and totally stopped following her. I asked her if this was her boyfriend, and she said yes, but they'd only been on a couple of dates. She told me that she was only 16, and she had to go home because it was already late. Yeah, a 16-year-old on a Monday at 4am. She definitely was. Right then, a police car drove by, also the only car on the road. The man scared away. Their yelling was so loud, of course one of the residents heard them. They were smarter than me and called up the cops. The girl told me her name and that she didn't want to get involved with police because of her strict parents and her being way too late already. No one in the police car saw us, and I told her to walk home because I wanted her to get there safe. She was glad and we walked away from the police car. Dumb thing to do and I regret it. I should have insisted that she told them her story. I know that now. In that moment, I thought it was the right thing to do. I walked her near to her apartment complex. It wasn't the direction I had to go. The man vanished after he had seen the police car, and I made sure he didn't follow us. He ran away in the opposite direction. I gave her my phone number and told her to write me a quick message when she got home safe because I felt a bit responsible for her now. The next dumb thing to do? I didn't walk her to her door. She was a naive, maybe shy girl, and I told her to break up with this piece of shit immediately. By that time, he'd sent her five messages and called her quite a few times. She never texted me back. I hope she got home safe and did break up with him, but now I'll never know.
I didn't want her to feel forced to give me her phone number. Now I regret this too. It likely was just a fight between two dumb and young kids, but I hate this uncertainty left inside me. He seemed angry, but not serial killer crazy. Maybe she was just too cool or afraid to text me, or she found it not important enough. So, to the girlfriend beating a wanker, let's not meet again. And to the girl, well, I hope you got home safe. This happened to my husband and I about three years ago, late in November. It still gives us chills to this day. While living in Seattle, my husband and I would frequently go surfing. Usually we'd drive out to Nia Bay or Westport, but on this particular weekend, the surf report looked pretty messy for spots located directly on the coast. We decided instead to try hitting some spots along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The land along the Strait is beautiful, but remote. You can only access it by driving all along Highway 112, which runs from Port Angeles to Nia Bay. There's no cell service along almost all of Highway 12, and only a small smattering of small towns. We decided to try surfing along the strait in this one spot, Twin. We'd surfed there before and had a good lay of the land. The report showed that the waves would be best in the early AM, so we opted to drive out the evening before and sleep in our car overnight. Since it was late November, we decided to forego paying for a camping spot at a nearby campground and would just park somewhere along the beach at Twin. We figured there would be no one there, and we were right. We arrived at around 3.30 p.m., and the only other people parked were a young couple and their Westphalia. Nothing terribly eventful occurred between our arrival and 7 p.m. We arrived, cooked some dinner, and I took a quick walk along the beach. The only other thing that occurred was just before sunset, we heard this loud whistling, and then saw some guy who had been walking along the highway come down the entrance road towards the beach. My husband and I both thought it was pretty fucking odd, given that there's absolutely nowhere you can easily walk to along that highway. All he had with him was a tiny backpack, so he definitely wasn't hiking. He said hello to the young couple as he walked along the beach. They invited him to hang out by their campfire for a while. The last time we saw any of them that night was when my husband and I decided to call it a night and go to sleep. This was at about 7 p.m. I woke up about an hour later and opened the car door a bit to try and get some fresh air. I noticed that the young couple's Westphalia was gone, and something about them being gone unnerved me. I couldn't put a logical finger on why, so I chalked my feelings up to just being tired and laid back down. When I woke up next, it was close to 11 p.m. This time I shot up so quickly that my husband woke up too. He asked me what was wrong. I said nothing, that I just woke up startled. He seemed completely relaxed and fell back asleep, but I stayed up for about 15 minutes trying to listen for anything. In hindsight, I think my intuition was screaming to me that something was off. Since I didn't hear anything, though, I laid back down and really tried to focus on getting some sleep. About 20 minutes later, I woke up again. This time, my husband was already up. He was sitting there silently, listening. Him sitting so still freaked me out. I turned on the car's interior lights and asked him what was up. He whispered, someone was tapping on the windows. I remember feeling this deep sense of dread. When I woke up a few hours ago, I noticed that the couple in the Westphalia left. There's no one else camping here. At that point, we both put our shoes on, grabbed flashlights, a knife, pepper spray, and opened the doors. Total silence. Pitch black darkness. My husband started up towards the trees behind us to look around, while I stood by our car and shined a light down onto the beach. I saw no one 
and sat on the back bumper while he continued to look. I checked to see if I had cell phone service. Nope. Nothing. Maybe two minutes later he returned, walking very fast. We need to leave. There's a car parked up by the exit road. It's just sitting there with the lights off and the ignition on. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside. No more than 60 seconds. We threw everything in the front seats into the back where we'd been sleeping, started up the car, and started driving back up towards the entrance road. We didn't want a chance taking the exit road and driving by that car. We peeled out of there so fucking fast, but in a moment of disorientation, my husband turned the wrong way and started driving down the highway towards Nia Bay. As we started going the wrong way, we drove past the exit road, and lo and behold, there was the car now with its lights on. A few seconds later, we both noticed that the car was speeding up behind us. I practically screamed, What the fuck are you doing? There's nowhere to turn around! The highway is narrow, with forest on one side and ocean on the other. Luckily, we saw a small turnout coming up. I remember my husband just saying fuck over and over, and then cutting hard to the left. As soon as we cut left, the person following us just kept going in the same direction. We took off down the highway going about 90, back towards Port Angeles. No one followed us the rest of the way back. I still feel deeply creeped out when thinking about the intentions of whoever was in that car. To whoever stalked us in the night, let's never meet again. I lived in a very medium-sized town my whole life. It was overran with the drugs and had one of the worst homelessness problems per capita in the country. Living there, I knew not to trust anyone, but I had enough friends there that I mostly felt safe. I transferred colleges to one of the biggest, richest cities in the country, and when this happened, I had been living there for about a year. I felt safe there, even alone. My school and home were outside of the regular touristy places, and my neighborhood was mostly retired rich couples or students like myself. I felt safe walking to and from school by myself, so I wasn't expecting this to happen. I normally don't give any strangers the time of day, mostly because I just didn't want to interact with people. But this day, I guess I was just feeling a bit... talkative. I was in my neighborhood walking back from school, but still a few streets away from my house, when I heard a voice above my music. I pulled out a headphone and stopped, and I heard a man calling out for me. I placed it behind me, but didn't see anything, and figured it must be coming from the car behind me. I don't know what was going through my head this day, and why I didn't just continue heading home, but I walked towards the car. It was a tan SUV, not screaming danger, but I made a mental note of the first three of his license plate. When I got to the passenger side window, it was already rolled down, and there was a man sitting in the driver's seat. He was in my general age range, had on nice clothes, a button-up and tie, and was admittedly attractive. Not out of place, and not immediately untrustworthy. I thought he needed directions. He asked me if I went to my college, and I said yes. He told me he sees me by the science building every day, and thought I was very pretty. This is where my alarm bell started to ring. My major was nowhere close to science, and I was only ever on campus twice a week, if that. He asked my name. I gave him a fake one but told him he must have mistaken me for someone else because I was never by science. He got extremely nervous, and I started to pull away. The alarms in my head were screaming at this point. He told me to wait, and asked if he could take me out for drinks right now, even though it was barely noon. I turned him down, citing the fact I had a boyfriend. He said, What, you can't have friends? in a condescending and forced casual way. Scared now, I apologized and said my boyfriend was waiting for me. 
a lie, but I felt like he needed to know someone would miss me. I've never had such strong fight-or-flight instincts hit me. I pulled away and walked away as fast as I could. I guess in the heat of the moment, I failed to check if he was following me. The next day I had class, I was walking up my street and stopped dead when I recognized his car. I feigned realizing I forgot something and walked back into my house frantically texting my boyfriend. I stopped walking to class for a whole month. A few days after this, I was getting ready to leave for work. I was working the open shift, so I was leaving my house at 4 a.m. Even before this, I was very careful about being aware of my surroundings, before and after getting into my car. As I was pulling out, I noticed his car about two houses down from mine, closer than the last time. I texted my boyfriend and let him know, and we agreed I wasn't going to be leaving the house alone until we figured out what was going on. I work in an industry that casually attracts cops, and the morning shift especially invited at least five of them at any time to be hanging out in our lobby. I had cultivated a strong and friendly relationship with quite a few of them. The morning that I left and noticed him, I sat down with all the cops that had gathered for the morning and explained my situation to them. They said that while something wasn't right, they couldn't really do anything for me because no threats had been made. Not long after my conversation with my cop friends, one of them was responding to a call about a suspicious vehicle. Completely by accident, he recognized the car as my description of the man's car and remembered my story. He told me he walked up to his car and asked what he was doing just sitting there, citing the call they had received. He noticed obvious evidence of surveillance. A camera, a few notebooks, food wrappers, and water bottles. They ran his info, and it turned out he had a warrant out for assault with a deadly weapon and harassment. I was called in shortly after to identify him and make a statement. After he was arrested, I was told it was obvious he had been stalking me for weeks. He had documented even when my boyfriend came and left, and admitted to wanting to kidnap me at some point, having all the equipment to do so in his car. He said he was just waiting for the right moment, but my boyfriend was always in the way. I thank those cops every day for saving me from what could have been the worst experience of my life and my observant neighbors for calling his car in. Moral of the story, trust your gut and always be aware of your surroundings. I was 18, living in college dorms several hours from home and working as a waitress at an upscale bar and restaurant. I'm short, barely five feet tall. I'm used to people being creepy and trying to intimidate me now, but as an 18 year old whose father had tried to protect her from the world and had been raised in a tiny, friendly town, it never occurred to me to be scared of the people who lurk in the dark. We had plenty of regulars, several of whom I became quite close with during my years working there, and a few of the frequent diners learned my name and general facts about me. I'm generally pretty open about who I am. One such man was tall, lanky, and several decades older, appearing to be in his mid-fifties. Joe. Joe was kind, a good man with a generous nature who owned a local shoe shop. The second time I was his waitress, he'd gifted me a pair of slightly worn work shoes and insisted that I accept them. Because of his kindness and the way he carried himself, people of all types flocked to him. One of them became the first man outside of my family that I feared. Joe came in with his younger brother, about the same height, slightly bulkier build and not unattractive, as I recalled. His eyes, though, unsettled me. In high school, I fancied myself a bit of a writer, but nothing in my vocabulary then or now could describe how unsettling his gaze was. It seemed almost dead, lifeless, but I assumed I was simply nervous. Joe was a good man, 
His brother was probably just less carefree, a bit more intense. The two dined together a few times in the coming weeks, but while Joe would normally request me as a server, he asked our host to assign one of the other servers to his table after the first time. Then one night, Joe's brother came in alone and requested me by name, and I was happy to oblige. For the first time, he seemed relaxed, energetic, and charismatic. He was interesting with a quick wit and a story for every topic I could throw at him. By the end of my shift, I assumed he just had a hard time relaxing with his brother. That may have been true, but through the laughter and charisma, his eyes never once seemed kind. They remained, through it all, lifeless. Eventually, it was time for me to leave, but he was still there and still expecting service. My manager offered to take over the table. He'd make sure I got the tip, but it was common knowledge I had an early morning class and likely had to do my homework. I jumped at the chance, but went to finish some closing duties and asked the man, my last table, if he needed anything else. He seemed off. As soon as I said I was heading home, he seemed to harden up. His voice was clipped and reminded me of my controlling ex-stepdad, which immediately put me on edge. I'd heard the same tone often enough as a little girl, right before being hit. I left immediately. I called my best friend and offered to buy him dinner if he'd meet me at a diner between the dorms and my work. I don't know why I did. I just felt that I needed someone to meet me sooner rather than later. Joe's brother hadn't in any way seemed dangerous, outside of the terseness in his voice before I left, but I knew that for most of my walk, which would have been poorly lit, I would be safer with the companion. We met together at the diner. We ate and laughed and headed back to the dorms, a good 25-minute walk. Only 15 or so in, the hairs on the back of my neck seemed to burn. Something was terrifying me, and I didn't know why. I told my friend who brushed it off, until he looked behind me and yelled. I turned and saw him. Joe's brother, only a few yards behind us holding a metal bar. I don't know what they're called, but you see them at construction sites, usually for reinforcement when pouring concrete. He was gripping it hard enough that his knuckles were white. It terrified me to my core, and I screamed. My friend grabbed my arm and we ran, even though my heart was in my throat and I couldn't hear anything past the blood roaring in my ears. I swear I could hear his footsteps right behind us. We ran right to the dorms, and I told security, who had us wait in the office while he looked at the cameras in the lot and called the police. The cops showed up but did nothing since all he did was scare us. After they left, the security man asked a few more questions and made a comment about a man standing at the entrance door for a bit before walking away. It was assumed he was homeless, but my blood ran cold. I called in for a few days, and when I went back to work, Joe was in. I told him what had happened, and he nodded. He didn't even seem to question the validity of what I had said. His brother, it turned out, had done some time for stalking and sometimes even attacking young women. He had even been sent to trial for assaulting one and hospitalizing her. Somehow he had managed to avoid jail time for the assault, but Joe said it was only a matter of time before he killed someone. I didn't see Joe often after that, and I never saw his brother again. The owner of the restaurant was angry for a long time, accused me of running off a regular who spent a lot of money when he came in. It took a few more scary encounters to make me a little more cynical. But to Joe's brother, let's not meet. I grew up for the first 13 years of my life in military bases. So after that, when my family moved out to the country, it was just like this whole new world to me. We lived in a very rural area. I loved it because there was such a feeling of loneliness about it. I sort of liked that myself, being apart from everyone. A lot of people seemed to like it because they could go hiking or exploring, 
That was not something I liked to do, though. One of the best things about it is that my dad loved to do these cookouts. I always liked that, especially when members of our family would come over as well. I remember all the things they used to bring. There were onions and cucumbers and vinegar, potato salad, macaroni salad, these really cool desserts. It was just all so fun. And we also got pop, which wasn't something we were allowed to have that often. This happened on one of those cookouts. There were easily about 20 people there all together. The dads always had beer and got drunk, which involved them getting really talkative and competitive. They would play horseshoes and lawn darts and other sorts of things when they were drinking. Often, they would do it well into the night. This time, it was cards. I remember that distinctly. This time, they were also outside, sitting at the picnic table playing. It was evening, and it hadn't gotten completely dark outside yet. Suddenly, one of the younger children, a girl, came running up the driveway screaming. Everyone asked her what was going on. She told them she'd just been attacked by a bat. Well, the pissing contest between the dads just got worse after that. At first, they didn't believe it was a bat, but some did, so they walked over to that area. Indeed, they found a bat flying around. Well, after that, they decided they should go and get my dad's rifle. They were all arguing about who had the best aim and could shoot the bat out of the sky. So at that point, we had five drunk dads with a rifle trying their best to shoot a flying animal out of the sky. Some of the smaller children were scared, and at least one of them was crying after the first shot went off. The wives didn't do anything about it other than take the kids inside the house. The older ones of us remained outside watching what was going on. There were several shots and everyone was missing the target. I was surprised that the first few gunshots were not scaring away the bat at first, but after a while it did fly a little away. This didn't stop the guys from keeping to try, though. The bat was not completely flying off, so they kept trying their best. Finally, my uncle succeeded in this stupid little contest. He shot the bat, and we watched it fall out of the sky. It was almost completely dark out, too, at that point. All of us watched it happen, though. Everyone was congratulating my uncle for his amazing shooting. Then, my dad told me to get the bat and bury it so the dog didn't try to eat it or anything. I didn't want to touch it either, so I went back to the house to get a pair of pliers. I went over to the area that I knew the bat was shot in. I was looking through the area using a flashlight. After a while, I did find the poor creature lying on the ground. I was irritated at my family for what they'd done. I mean, that bat wasn't bothering anyone. It scared a cousin of mine, but it didn't chase or bite anyone, it seemed. It was guilty of nothing but just being a bat. I reached down with pliers to try and pick it up. However, before I could get a hold of its wing, the bat's wing suddenly moved a bit and startled me. That made me drop the pliers. I was startled and upset that the bat hadn't died yet and was probably in quite a lot of pain, which I figured I would have to put it out of myself. I was pretty upset about that too. I reached down to pick up the pliers while thinking about what I had to do to put the animal out of its misery. When I reached over, though, the bat moved quickly and bit me right on the hand. I jumped back and fortunately it did not latch onto me. Still, though, it was quite a terrifying thing to suddenly happen, and yeah, it did hurt quite a bit. My concerns for the bat were really out the window at that point. I still put it out of its misery, though. I won't tell you the specifics since I like animals and I know a lot of other people do too, so it might be traumatizing to hear that. I ran up to the house. Keep in mind, I was only 13 years old. I didn't exactly know much about rabies, so I didn't know how quickly it might set in. I was just really scared. When I got into the house, my family was curious about what I'd done with the bat, but they noticed how freaked out I was. I explained what happened and that the bat was dead, but I couldn't take the time to bury it. My family took me to the hospital, while someone else buried the bat. I was terrified. The entire way there, I was freaked out. Although I was told I couldn't really develop the symptoms of rabies for days, and there was no guarantee that the animal had it anyway, I was still really anxious, and no one could calm me down just by telling me that. The bat was pretty scary, too. You know what's scarier, though? when they told me what they had to do to treat me for the bite. 
You see, this was back in the 1980s. Nowadays, you just get four normal shots of the rabies vaccine in your arm over 14 days. Back then, you had to get 13 shots of the vaccine in the stomach. It was scary as hell, and it hurt, too. We did bury the bat, and I never developed rabies. Of course, I couldn't really tell this story if I did, because I would have died for sure. But I had quite the terrifying night that night. This story might be a little sad for some people who love animals. I felt I should get that out of the way before I tell this story. I used to live out in the country. I was born and raised there, in fact. But where I lived was not one of those places where houses were really far away from each other. We actually lived on a dirt road that was made specifically by five families. There were two families who built houses. Then there were three that were mobile homes. We even got to name the street as well, so the parents used the names of all the children. We lived in a mobile home. We always liked it quite a bit. We had a cat and dog, and neighbors had dogs too. For a lot of the time, we would not have our dogs on a leash, and they would go out and play together. They always got along well. We always made up stories about the dogs being married or in love. We were really weird like that. There were some interesting places to play too. There was a whole lot of country out there, and places for us to play, plus the dogs. Often, one of the dogs would be gone for a while, because he or she was out playing in the woods. There were tons of things to have fun with out there, and the dogs just loved it. We never worried about them. But one time, we did get quite concerned about one of them. The dog's name was Buddy. I remember that I was in my house watching TV, I heard someone call out for Buddy. I was interested, so I went outside to see who it was. It was one of the kids I regularly played with, so I asked her what happened. She told me that Buddy had been gone for a long time. Our dogs went out and explored a lot, but they always came back long before nightfall. The sun was already on the horizon, so it would be totally dark really soon. I never really went out to the woods when it was like that. I ran back into the trailer, though, and grabbed a flashlight. I have to admit, it was scary going through the woods while the sun was going down, and we were looking for a dog as well. With the sun setting like it was, all the trees around us looked really creepy. We were both only around 12 years old at the time, so it was just so much easier for us to get scared. When it got dark enough, we switched on the flashlight. That somehow made things even scarier. We didn't want to go home without finding her dog, though, so we put up with being scared. We'd rather be terrified in the woods than lose our dog. We were out there for about an hour. It was the weirdest thing. Something ran right up to us, from behind. Something ran right up to us from behind and almost knocked Sarah over. When we recovered from this jump scare, we realized it was Buddy. We don't know why Buddy was out in the woods for that long. He seemed completely fine, though. He was happy to see us just acting like his normal self, but his normal self was never out late like that. Anyhow, we were happy to see him and took him straight home. It was less scary going back through the woods with a German shepherd with you. When we got home, we explained to our parents what we had done. After that, we really didn't put much thought into it. It was about five days before we noticed anything wrong but it wasn't anything we thought about too much. Buddy began spending a lot of time sleeping, stopped eating much, and would throw up whatever he did eat. Us kids were concerned, but the parents just thought Buddy had a cold and would get over it eventually. They were definitely not the kind of people to take a dog to the vet, and Buddy was an outside dog 24-7 anyway, so we really only saw him when we were outside playing with him. It might have been close to two weeks or a little more when things got worse. I was outside during twilight. I was supposed to go behind the house, take the garbage bags out of the cans that were there, and move them to the road. There was no one outside when I got to the back. It was not completely dark out yet, so I hadn't bothered to turn the porch light on. When I got behind the house, I noticed that Buddy was lying down behind the garbage cans. I was happy to see him as usual. Hey, Buddy. I said to him. At first he didn't move, 
That worried me, but it wasn't like he was dead or anything. When I tried calling him another time, he cut me off when he got up. I didn't see anything at first. I thought he and I were going to play for maybe a few moments. But he got up. He walked around the garbage can, and that's when I saw it. He was foaming at the mouth. That was scary enough, but when he started to growl at me, a low and scary growl that he'd never done before like he was somewhat agitated, he kept growling, but he stopped a few feet from me. He looked at me, and I looked into his eyes. His eyes looked different. I can't perfectly explain it, but I will try. It just looked like he didn't recognize me. I looked into his eyes, and I did not see Buddy in those eyes. He didn't come at me, but I was standing as still as possible. Buddy was a dog, and dogs like to chase people, and I didn't want to give him a reason to do that. He barked again and kept growling at me. I was terrified. I had never seen a rabid animal before. I didn't know how aggressive he could be. I tried to back away slowly from him, but stopped when he moved toward me. I was really terrified. I thought he would attack and kill me. I don't have to admit that I cried a little bit because I was so scared. That's when I heard it. A loud noise, which I guess was a gunshot. This happened to me right after high school. I was going to Princeton for college in the fall, and I wanted to have a nice and relaxing summer before doing that. I had one cousin whose family was pretty wealthy and had a house with a big pool in it. The house was way out in the country away from anyone. When you're wealthy, you can sometimes afford to do that sort of thing. Well, she had also gotten a DUI and wasn't able to drive anywhere, so having me come and spend the summer with her helped her as well. I was able to drive her car, a Jaguar, for the summer, and that was such a good thing for me. As much as I was looking forward to the pool, for some really weird reason, I did not bring my swimsuit with me. The first day I was there, I went to a shop to get something. Now, I didn't really have a lot of money back then, and the money I did have would have to be going for college, so I couldn't waste it on fanciful things. The cheapest swimsuit I could find that I liked was a shiny blue Speedo. I had worn Speedos a lot because I was on the high school swim team. I have to admit I always got a little turned on by wearing Speedos, but that most likely didn't factor into my decision. When I went to pay for it, I got a little annoying feedback from the cashier, teasing me over buying the Speedo instead of getting board shorts. Well, it was a surf shop that I had bought it from after all. Surfers don't wear Speedos, which makes me wonder why the shop even had them in the first place. Their house was amazing. I had a lot of rich family members, but unfortunately mine weren't one of them. My dad eventually got a lot of money, but by that time I was estranged from him. Rather than help me pay for college, he just wanted to be left off as a family member, so I could get more loans for school. But let's get back to the house. It was a big and neat mansion out in the country. It was huge, had two stories, a huge attic, and a basement. There were tons of rooms, and the room I got to stay in was luxurious. It was going to be a really neat summer. I should get to the scary experience that both my cousin and I had, though. It was really terrifying when it happened. One thing about the house was that several rooms had fireplaces and chimneys, but they didn't really use them that often. I loved swimming in her pools, and I quickly discovered that buying the Speedo was a good idea. She had almost exclusively gay friends, and since I had a swimmer's body and a really snug blue Speedo, I got a whole lot of attention from those guys, and I really liked it. Yeah, I was young, so I played around with a few of them. This was especially after we smoked some cigars, and one of them complimented me highly on my cigar smoking skills. Anyway, on the day this happened, I was alone in the pool. I was still in my Speedo, just floating along. It was kind of nice. That was until I heard my cousin screaming from outside the house. I was startled and briefly went underwater. I quickly swam to the end of the pool and pulled myself out. I didn't even bother grabbing a towel or anything. I was just concerned about my cousin. When I got to her, though, I noticed something very weird. The next-door neighbor's Doberman was by her. I thought at first maybe the dog had tried to attack her, but it looked like she was trying to corral him. 
and that's when I noticed it. There was a swarm of bats. I mean, a ton of them. They were flying around. She was trying to protect the dog. It was very noble of her, but I damn well wasn't thinking that at the time. I had run up to her, and now I was in the midst of the swarm of bats too. Seeing one bat can be terrifying. This was dozens, maybe even a hundred, I don't even know. For some reason, they were just flying around us. It was like the Alfred Hitchcock movie The Birds, but if he had done it with bats instead, which might be a little more scary. The bats started hitting me too. That was the scariest part. We didn't run away for two reasons. The dog was not coming away with us, and running in any direction would have us running into the bats. There were a whole lot of mosquitoes out there at the time and bats eat them, so we figured out later that was probably why they were swarming like that. Eventually, we got the dog to come with us, and we ran to the back door. The bats followed us to the sliding glass door and tried to follow me inside the house. Thankfully, only a few of them got in. We got into a room with no bats before we called some service to come and take care of them. It was my cousin who did that. I didn't know who it was, but they came and were able to remove the bats from the house. It turns out that they had been living in the chimney of one of the unused fireplaces, and for some reason they had flown out in a swarm. But just imagine that. You're living in a house with a chimney, and for who knows how long, hundreds of bats are just living in them without you knowing it. Really, that was much freakier than the attack itself. We both checked each other for bat bites. Thank God they weren't there. We got very lucky. The possibility of getting rabies is scary. The service company was able to get all of the bats out of all of the chimneys. It horrified us to know that there were more in there. We didn't ask how many. We didn't want to know. This story took place when I was 23 years old, close to 10 years ago. I was living in upstate New York in a very rural area with my ex-boyfriend and his family. He and I used to argue quite a bit. One morning before he went to work, he and I got into a very heated argument. He was 20 years my senior, but during this particular fight he acted majorly juvenile. He jumped out of bed, flipped me the bird, and yelled, If you don't like it so much, then why don't you go back to the fucking Bronx? That was all the prompting I needed. I threw on my Uggs and my winter jacket, grabbed my cigarettes, and flew right out of the house. I'm unfortunately an impulsive ass, and didn't think to grab my cell phone before I stormed out. I didn't drive, so my only option was to walk. I don't think at the time that I intended to walk all the way back to the Bronx, as I was a three-hour car ride upstate. I just needed to go on an angry, dramatic walk to let off some steam. I realized once I got to this road at the entrance of the trailer park that I had no idea where anything really was around me. I had only lived there for a few months at that point, and we didn't really exactly go out a lot. I banked left and just walked and walked, where I knew civilization was. I found myself walking alongside a very busy stretch of road, with 18-wheelers flying by, spraying me with slushy snow and soaking my shoes. I saw my then-boyfriend driving by on his way to work. He sped up as he drove past me, evidently still very angry about our fight. I thought for sure he was going to turn around at some point, but he never came back. I pressed on, deciding instead to try and walk to my best friend's mother's house, which I knew to be in the same town. It started to snow pretty soon, though, and I was losing momentum. I passed by a VFW, where a nondescript pickup truck was parked in the driveway. It wasn't until I passed it that I even realized the driver was in the front seat. He called out to me. Hey, honey, do you need help? My stomach churned, realizing I would have to accept this stranger's offer. I approached his truck slowly and tried to weigh out my options. He was a clean-cut, seemingly normal, older white guy. Gray hair, greenish-blue eyes, 
very average. I don't know why, but I blurted out, Are you a good guy or a bad guy? I cringed at myself for asking such a dumb question. I'm a good guy. I wouldn't tell you if I was a bad guy. I ignored the bells going off in my head and hopped in the front seat with them. As we drove, I realized I had no clue where my friend's mom actually lived. I knew the name of the road she lived on, but it spanned a good distance, so it wasn't very helpful in terms of finding my destination. I asked to borrow his cell phone so I could try calling my best friend to ask her where the fuck I was going. I called her three times, and she didn't answer because she didn't recognize the number. I started to feel inexplicably hopeless. After a few minutes, he asked me where I was from, and why I was out in the middle of nowhere in the snow wearing only pajamas. I explained I was originally from the Bronx, and that I had gotten into a fight with my boyfriend. He paused for a moment and said, Hey, you wouldn't be interested in making a little money, would you? I chuckled nervously. Oh, uh, no thanks, though. Well, I just figured, since you said you were from the Bronx, and trailed off. Realizing at that point that I was almost definitely in some deep shit, I muttered, Oh, sure, sure. He eyed me up and down and laughed to himself before sneering. I started to panic big time, but I knew I couldn't show my fear. I scoured the scenery for a pillowy snowbank that I could land in if I left out of the truck, but to no avail. The houses were so few and far in between. I became certain this would be how I met my demise. I'll never know why, but it was at this point that he decided to ask me who I was going to see. I quickly blurted out my best friend's mom's name and her husband's full name. He instantly parked up and explained that he knew the husband. They used to snowmobile together 20 years ago. I felt the greatest wave of relief when he explained that he knew exactly where his old buddy lived. When we finally pulled up to that big yellow house, it was like arriving to the promised land. I sheepishly asked his name. Steve, he said. He then asked mine. I gave him a fake name spat out a bullshit thank you and ran as fast as I could from his truck to the porch. I crashed through the front door and locked it behind me. I immediately started crying and running through the house, trying to find my friend's mom. I had awoken her from a sound sleep, but she didn't say a word upon seeing how shaken up I was. Once I knew I was safe with her, I explained everything. The fight, the fleeing, the weird guy and his sexual proposition, she listened, horrified and curious at the same time. She made me promise to never do anything so reckless again, and that if I needed her, to just call her. She told me she would ask her husband when he got home about this Steve guy, and find out more about him. I returned to my boyfriend's later that same day, and got really stoned to try and forget about the events of that morning. The following day, my friend's mom called me, to tell me that Steve was a very dangerous person who her husband had cut off communication with years ago. The last he had heard about Steve was that he had been arrested for sexual assault. She then went on to point out how easy it would have been for him to hurt me and lead me just about anywhere on some lonely stretch of road. No one would even know where to look for me, not to mention I might not have even been found until the snow thawed out. Upon sharing this post with the best friend of mine mentioned in the story, she reminded me that I left out a super unsettling detail. When her mom called, she was able to tell me Steve's last name. One of the first results on Google with his name, plus the town's name, brought me straight to a registered sex offender website with a mugshot of him. His eyes looked cold and empty, and I realized that with him being on probation at the time, he would have been especially eager to not have me get him in any further trouble with the law. Her mom said it best when she told me that I must have some serious guardian angels looking out for me. Sorry about the length, but this happened ritualistically and periodically throughout my whole life. 
It all started when I was probably about the age of nine, in the summertime. My brother was a year younger than me, and long story short, he convinced me to go look for some cats that he had seen. I put my shoes on and followed my little brother out the door. We walked the streets in search of bastard kittens, completely unsupervised. I lived in a small town, and my mom worked at Pizza King until 9 p.m. every weekday. My dad worked until midnight at Johnson Controls. That left our older sister, 13 at the time, to supervise us, but she was always off doing God knows what. Because of these circumstances, I realized later that we were perfect targets. Predictable schedules, lack of supervision, and comfortable in our tight-knit Midwestern neighborhood. My brother led me about six blocks away when someone called out to us. I turned my head to find four young men leaning up against an old gray two-door beater. They were standing outside of a known drug house. They were smoking cigarettes and seemingly minding their own business. The one who called out to us, closest to the passenger seat, asked us, Do you guys want some gum? I stopped dead in my tracks, and my brother looked confused. They offered us gum? It was eerily reminiscent of our yearly stranger danger assemblies in the school auditorium. My brother and I looked at them for a moment, but then turned around and started walking back the way we came, saying nothing. They yelled at us to stop, and we turned our heads and saw the driver getting into his car quickly, the passenger pulling the seat up to let the other two in the back. As the engine started up, we both ran. We ran through the yard of a man whose lawn was always way overgrown. We tried to crouch low to the ground and lose them, but the loud engine of that old beater was getting closer. It didn't occur to me that they could see the grass moving as we crawled through. I got up this time and ran at full speed, weaving in and out of people's yards to try and buy us some time. They followed us the whole way. When I realized there was no outrunning a car, we took a straight line to one of our neighbor's houses and started beating on their back door. The car sped out from around the corner and stopped abruptly in the driveway. We abandoned that idea and hopped over her fence. We eventually made it back to our house and thought we'd lost them. My mom's voice startled me from behind. Where have you been? Where's your sister? I think she had come home because she was on a delivery route that day. Sometimes, when someone messed up a pizza, the owners would let my mom take it home to us if she was on delivery, so that we had something to eat when the pantry was empty. I started to tell my mom what happened. She didn't look like she was too keen on buying my story at first, until I stopped mid-sentence at the sound of a sputtering engine. I looked outside. The four men drove past our house slowly, looking into our windows and making eye contact, giving us a menacing look. My mom saw the men and tried to close the blinds. The track was broken, but failed. She told us to stay inside for the rest of the day. She left after that. I can't explain why, so don't ask. She just did. Later that night, still no sign of our sister anywhere, and we were hungry. We made some mac and cheese and put on Hannah Montana to get our minds off things. Laughing at scenes that weren't even funny, my nerves started to settle a bit. However, I kept on seeing this tiny red light in the corner of my eyes, coming from the window. I kept brushing it off. It could have been anything. After some time, I finally stood up and went over to the window to investigate. I saw that this red dot was actually the light of a video camera. I gasped at the sight of this, and the man holding it ran away immediately, towards another man illuminated by a street light down the road. Naturally, I panicked and cried. I ran outside and screamed my sister's name as loud as I could. I ran back inside. I called 911 first, then my mom. I told them that there were two men with what I thought was a video camera outside on the street. The police showed up after circling the area, said they'd stake out for a couple of hours at the house on the corner, 
but that the man would probably be long gone. They never did find the man, but the man found us, over and over again. A couple of years later, my brother had the neighbor's kid over for a sleepover. We all hung out in his room until late at night, laughing loudly and shooting BB guns at the ceiling and each other. I left the room, and when I came back, my brother had told me that a hand had slapped the window and slid down, just like in a horror film. I thought he was just trying to scare me, and I still believe he was probably lying. I was just in the middle of telling him how full of shit he was when I saw that little red dot again out of the corner of my eye, silencing all of us. We ducked to the floor at first, silent, unbreathing, then my brother crawled over and turned off the light. We stayed there for a long time until waking our parents up, but they found nothing. I passed it off as a prank. Another couple of years later, in an insomniac-induced all-nighter, I was sitting in our sunroom, with big windows all around and no curtains, reading a book. It was about three o'clock in the morning, and the whole house was asleep. I had my headphones in, listening to my mp3 player, when I thought I heard a loud noise over the music. I looked up, startled, and I saw a man at the door watching me at three in the morning. This was the closest I had ever been to him. I froze and stared at him. He was about six feet tall. His hair was long and wavy over his eyebrows. It almost looked kind of like bangs or a comb over without enough gel. He was wearing a white hoodie, and long blue pants that nearly covered his shoes. He looked like an aged up version of the man who had offered us a piece of gum years before. He had a blue digital camera in his hand, down to his side. He walked away casually, without fear or haste, maintaining eye contact the whole time. I followed him with my eyes, past the windows, and behind the only window that was concealed with blinds out of my sight. I ran inside and told no one. I passed it off as a sleep-deprived hallucination for months, denying the nightmares and cold chills. I finally came to the realization. This was the man I had seen years before, and I remembered something. That door's lock was broken. Those weren't the only times we caught someone outside our windows. It happened for years, and it almost became an odd fact of life. He seemed to be less interested the older I grew, though. It's strange because he always purposely reveals his presence to me instead of trying to stay discreet. He even showed his face to me that one night. It makes me wonder what kinds of pictures and videos he's captured, how long he would watch before making himself known to us. I used to convince myself that these were several unrelated instances, because it scared me more to think that one person had the capacity to invest so much time into us. It seems like an odd revenge for outrunning him years before. A few years back when I was 19, I had just gotten my first apartment in the basement of an apartment complex. That might sound odd, but a friend's mother talked to the apartment's landlord to find me a cheap place to live. This was in Denver, so it wasn't cheap for a one-bedroom apartment in most places. This is all relevant later. The basement apartment was a studio located at the base of a flight of stairs. It was the only apartment at the bottom of these stairs, between the apartment's boiler room and laundry area even farther down a brick hallway with a screen door, and landing before you finally got to my apartment door. The first few months of living alone were fine. There was a smoking area up the flight of stairs that led to my apartment. One day, I was up there having a cigarette, when a Native American man sat next to me and also started smoking. He was a resident in the apartment. His name was John. John seemed mostly normal, maybe a little lonely, but nothing unnerving. He said he lived alone and he was an artist. We chatted until my cigarette was through. I said goodbye to John and went back downstairs. 
I would see John occasionally smoking as I was going to or from work. He always just said hi to me and never gave off any red flags, which makes all this all the more creepy. One night, as I was laying there asleep, I woke up to the sound of the doorknob to my apartment jiggling. It was like someone was frantically trying to break the lock. I got out of bed and immediately grabbed a knife from the kitchenette. If this had been a normal room in the apartment complex, someone would have heard the doorknob rattling, but my apartment was secluded on the subterranean level. I stood right next to the jiggling doorknob and said, Hello? Who's there? No one answered. I looked through the peephole, but it was way too dark to see. I said to the door in a loud and confident voice, If you come in here, I will kill you. I was serious about it too. Back then I was pretty fearless and in a not so great mental state. Just explaining because some people questioned my reaction to this event. The jiggling immediately stopped. Whoever it was booked it back through the screen door, down the hallway and up the dark flight of stairs. I don't know if they thought I was asleep until then or what, but I think I scared them. I could see their dark outline going up the stairs through the peephole but I couldn't make out the person's features. I made a mistake that night when I decided not to call the cops. I felt like it would be a hassle, and that it was probably just some drunk person causing a bit of mischief. My heart was pounding from the adrenaline, but I felt confident I could take care of myself, and I mostly put the incident out of my mind. About a week later, very late at night, at around 2 a.m., I woke up and realized the door to my apartment was wide open. I was in shock. I couldn't really process what I was looking at. I walked towards the door, wondering how someone could have just come and left while making no sound. I remember my heart was beating furiously, and it was difficult to breathe. Every footstep felt like I was walking further into a fatal danger zone. I examined the door, the doorknob had been completely removed from its socket. I don't know how he broke the doorknob out of there without waking me up. I've entertained many possibilities. Maybe he used a knife and carved it out. Maybe it wasn't fastened securely in the first place, and it just popped out on accident. But it held pretty sturdily when he was jiggling it the week before. I'm a fairly light sleeper, so I just don't understand how he could have done that. It still bothers me to this day. There was a clean hole where the doorknob was mounted to the door, and the doorknob was gone. I never did manage to find it. The kitchen knife I had threatened the intruder with the week before was lying on the ground next to my bed. Maybe I'd gotten up and put it next to me in my sleep. I don't know. It's all a mystery to me, and that's why this occurrence still bothers me so much. I just can't figure it out. A person had been in my room, possibly watching me sleep for a while, but they had left without doing anything bad to me. I'm lucky, I guess, but I'll never really know why. I bought a deadbolt for the door and had the doorknob replaced. Since people will probably ask, I did not call the cops. Like I said, I was in a very bad mental state and didn't really have a lot of energy to care about myself, but that's besides the point. I was really on edge for the next few weeks, but nothing happened until a few weeks later, when the guy tried to break in again in broad daylight. He was doing his doorknob jiggling routine again. I looked out, and I saw this time that it was John, completely drunk. I know because I yelled at him, and he scurried drunkenly back up the stairs just like the first time. Apparently he was known for having a bad drinking problem. After that time, the entire complex knew what he'd done, and the owner of the building urged me to press charges. I believe they also evicted John. I didn't press charges, however, for the aforementioned reasons. I moved out very shortly after anyway. Like I said, the unanswered questions still haunt me. What did he want? Was it him that broke in? Was it all just a nasty trick my own mind played on itself? I'll never really know.
Many years ago, when I must have been in about grade five or six, my parents started working more, leading to me having to catch the bus and walk the rest of the way back home. There was nothing bad about this, and I enjoyed the walks quite a lot too. I'd been doing it for about a year, and each day I noticed the same man parked in a driveway with his dark blue ute and almost every time a cigarette in his mouth. I saw him two days in a row the first time and thought nothing of him. A few days passed without me seeing him. Then the next week I walked past the house and his car was there with no one in it. I felt uneasy walking past it though, and as I did I noticed a camera poorly hidden away just in front of the steering wheel. I pretended not to notice it, but in my head I knew exactly why it was there. For the rest of the week, that camera was there. At the end of the week, he'd sit in his car and check his watch as soon as I walked by. He was trying to figure out the time that I came past him. I wanted to take a different route home, but I couldn't really do much else as the only way would always inevitably result with me walking past this house. For maybe a month, he'd be sitting in his car staring at me each time. I still don't know if he thought I couldn't see him, because he was really bad at being discreet. Then one day, he was leaning on his car door. As I walked past, he said something along the lines of, Hey mate, you need a ride home? Obviously, I said no. He kept on trying to get a yes from me, but I never stopped refusing. I could tell he was getting mad, and he could tell that I knew too, so he calmed down and told me sorry. The next day, I see his ute drive up behind me. He slows down as he comes next to me, and rolls down his window, asking me if I wanted to ride again. He drove off the first time I said no this time. It goes maybe a week or two without seeing him. After I thought I would never have to see him again, suddenly he drives past. He asked the exact same question, and when I refused, he just told me to get into the car. I said that I wasn't getting in, that he can leave me alone. He changed his tone a lot, and that's when he told me he had a gun. I lived in a small Australian city, and the chances of him having a gun are next to zero. It was easy to tell he was trying to scare me. He then played it off as a joke after I was unfazed and leaned over to open the door. Get in, mate. It's much better in here than out there where it's hot. I've got air conditioning. It's 38 degrees Celsius outside, you know. You probably know all about stranger danger and all that, but I promise that's not who I am. Hop on in. I remember that word for word and it scares me to think of that to this day. No, my house is right here. Leave me alone, please. The only problem was, my house was still half a kilometer away at the very least. I proceeded to walk up to a random house's driveway and knock on the door. I had no idea who these people were. He stared at me as I waited for the door to open. I heard the doorknob turn, and before the person could even say anything, I bumped past them and got inside. Now that I think about it, it might have been just as dangerous to enter a random person's house than a random person's car. The man's expression changed, and he sped off after the house owner glared at him. The owner was a very nice old woman. I told her that he tried to convince me to go into his car. She called my parents right away and I waited outside of her house for them to arrive. My mom was so grateful, and my dad was pretty much in shock. My mom then constantly visited the old lady, as she lived alone and she wanted to be nice. I never really thought as a kid about how lucky I was that the house I entered wasn't the wrong one to go into. I try not to think about that whole experience, because it all genuinely terrifies me. I don't know what happened to the man, Never saw him again, and I definitely don't miss him.